All right, folks, if we could take our seats and for a minute, get settled and please rise for the pledge. budget hearings and we're going to start with the Hillview. Mr. Hemi, before you start Mr. Hemi, on behalf of the board, we're sorry for the loss of your wife. Thank and, you. Um, the, the support of the town is behind you and thank you for being here under all the circumstances that you're under, your family and all, but you have our blessings and uh, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Uh, so my name is, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Peter Hemi. I'm the treasurer of the Hillview Committee, uh, here to present our budget for next year. Uh, our budget for next year is very similar to the budgets we've had pretty much every year, except that um, during this last fiscal year, the contract with the <coughs> operator of the golf course uh, ended. So we, we put out for bid for a new proposals and uh, unfortunately we only got one serious proposal from the current uh, operator GFMI who we have been very happy with on how they've been running the golf course. Uh, unfortunately their rates have gone up over time. Um, that's a combination of a lot of things, mostly the fact that the um, minimum wage for a lot of their low paying employees have gone up over the last year or so. So as you can see from our budget, um, we are again forecasting you know, a break even. Our revenue has remained <coughs> fairly stable. The improvements we've made to the golf course over the past few years uh, have certainly helped. I think it's probably been in the best shape that it's been in in a number of years. Those of you who have played it, um, I think would Second that, if you haven't played it, I would encourage you to come out and play it. It's a, a fun track and uh, in really good shape. Um, there is one uh, exceptional item we have in the budget this year, and that is in the golf cart rentals. Uh, we are entertaining the idea about not um, releasing new golf carts this year. Our lease ends. Uh, we're going to be purchasing those golf carts like we do every year but we're going to try to squeeze out another year uh, of them, which you know, we'll see how that works this year. This is the first time we're trying it. So it's another you know, way of us trying to save some money. Unfortunately, we do have to lay out some money to, to purchase the golf course, uh, the golf carts this year. Uh, that's pretty much it. You know, we've, we've had a pretty good year so far. Uh, unfortunately, March hasn't cooperated from the weather standpoint. But uh, we're looking forward to hopefully opening up very soon. Are you going to have a rate increase? Uh, not this year. No not rate. this year, but probably the following year. We do it every couple of years. Every couple of years, okay. Yeah. So we, we constantly benchmark you know, our rates versus the other courses around. Um, typically, we do it every, every two years. Do you find having now the pub sort of settled as helping with the numbers? The, um, the golfers have remained relatively stable. Um, they're, believe it or not, the golfers have not su been supporting the pub as much as we'd like. Uh, we are in the process of working with the pub, uh, the person running the pub, and Chris Carter, the, the golf, to try to do some specials to see if we can bring some more people in. Um, he has been very successful on the bereavement and the uh, upstairs doing functions but clearly the pub is not getting you know as much use as we would really like from the golfers so we're going to try to do a few things this year that would be good any questions I think um, 
FinCom, any questions? <clears throat> Mr. Masseri. Uh, what are your capital needs this coming year? So we, yeah, so we have in uh, the capital plan $75,000, um, mostly for equipment for the golf course. A lot of the greens mowers and fairway mowers are from 1992, 1993, are starting to break down. And more importantly, we're not able to get replacement parts. So we're trying to get back on a schedule of replacing those uh, capital equipment on a regular basis. We will, you know, like every year, we will take a look at where we are from a revenue standpoint, you know, towards the end of the year and see whether or not it makes sense to, to purchase that. Uh, that's always been the, uh, the item that we've either spent or pushed out depending on how our revenue is coming in each year. But it's mostly for equipment. So you'll be finishing up this year and right. we depending were on how the, the rest of the year finishes up, you may or may not be buying some equipment this year too. Correct. We have we have money in there, thirty five thousand this year to buy some equipment. We were running ahead uh, in December. Uh, unfortunately, with the snow and everything, we didn't get any revenue in March. So we'll see how April, May turns out, and whether we spend that money in the June timeframe. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Was there any appreciable damage to the course with that recent heavy snowfall we had? Uh, a lot of tree limbs, um, you know, we have, fortunately we have in the budget a lot of uh, maintenance money, so we, we unfortunately have to take down a few trees, that limbs came down, but there no damage to the greens. The greens were okay. okay. Which is, you know, what we were all worried about. I hope there's a few trees that are usually getting my way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're taking recommendations on which trees to take down, so. Okay. All right, and we don't have any other questions. Uh, you have free. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. <coughs> Park and Recreation. Mr. Chairman, Liz. Uh, yes. Three oh five. It's on three oh five. Liz is eating up all my extra time. <laughs> so as we've done for some of the other uh, budget hearings, I just wanted to um, make a quick note. Um, for Parks and Recreation, there was an update today to their budget. Um, there's two items that were updated. One is that the non-union agreement was um, ratified and the new rates went into effect. Um, for last pay period. So Maureen has updated the Parks and Rec budget to reflect the current rates as of today. And she has also um, been able to achieve the increase in sa the achieve savings within her other budget lines without increasing the subsidy in which Parks and Rec receives for three of the non-union employees. Um, so she was able to do that, which is great. Also, um, in the budget that is in front of you, it was submitted with capital items of approximately $95,000. Some of those items have been pulled out and they will be part of the um, capital plan that we will see presented on April 23rd. And there's been reductions um, even in those that Maureen has achieved savings for, from some of the quotes that she received. So she'll discuss that further, but I just wanted to give you okay. an overview that there will be an updated budget put in um, to Dropbox and Maureen will review the, the slight changes. Um, the town administrator's budget request um, includes the full subsidy that Parks and Rec is uh, requesting for FY19. So, thank you. Now I'll turn it over to Maureen. Thank you. Well, that was a nice introduction. <laughs> um, I'm Maureen Stevens. I'm the department head of uh, Parks and Recreation and also the operation director as well. And as Liz said, um, we worked today uh, to do some last minute changes to the budget to achieve some savings to keep the budget where it 
where it originally was um, through a couple of changes. So um, it'll show later on in my slideshow. I gotta show you the pretty stuff first, for sure. So um, this is who we are. Um, it's the uh, three directors who have 53 years experience in the department. Uh, we have a secretary, parks foreman, a programmer, all told they have 30 years, a maintenance craftsman, parts maintenance, 14 years. So all together with our core set of people who basically work every day, we have 97 years of department experience. So uh, that's why we can do what we do. We're a team, we consider ourselves a team and we work as a team. Um, and it works out very well and we are there for each other when it comes to savings or brainstorming or whatever, can, whatever it takes to get the job done. So this is the recreation programs aspect of it. Um, uh, this is a, Lynn Clemens is in charge of this and she does a fantastic job. We have 2,537 member accounts. That's basically like family accounts, which is quite a few. Could have three people in it, could have one, could have five. Um, so that all tells you we have 5,773 members within that. Last year we took in 4,249 registrations, of which 3,866 were residents, 383 were non-residents. Uh, Lynn offered 109 programs last year, um, all told during the year, whether they were Pee Wee this, this, you name it, she did it. So um, we hit all that, zero to 99, and we're not even kidding. It's, you know, we have kids who are 0 0.8 who come into our programs. Um, and they work, they work the programs morning, afternoon, evening, weekdays, and weekends. Uh, one of our more successful programming is in the summer. That's where we get the bulk of our income. Um, when it comes down to it, uh, Lynn runs a fantastic program, hires a lot of local, um, I don't want to say kids, but uh, young adults. And uh, they're generally everything, honor students, sports, um, every type of aspect, and they're all, she hires a fantastic array of um, counselors. And they run the Summer Skate program, which is a full program, 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. We had 299 children in that program last year, and that goes on field trips every Wednesday, um, should it not be a short week. And that is uh, grades, basically K through eight. Kin, uh, Kid Connection is uh, potty trained through, about age five, that program runs 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., four days a week. She had 60 children in that, 59. She ran 20 science and sports clinics during the summer, and um, they were all full <laughs> to capacity and, uh, and then some. Um, we had an in-search last year, we did a lot of trips. We did day, overnight, weeks, we went to various places, so that was great. And we offered some discount tickets to the public to, for their own savings, so and there's quite a few and they, they partake in all of them. So this is some of the kids from our most successful program, Summer Escape 2017, at a field trip at Altitude Trampoline Park, and they're with Joey. Um, uh, she runs a Pee Wee soccer program, it's out here, it's also at Ipswich River Park, that's uh, generally uh, ages three to five-ish, um, and uh, again, capacity on those on Saturdays, it's full, 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 fantastic program. This is something that she um, gets together with the community and gets the trucks. She goes and um, asks the DPW or Reading Light, the fire department, um, and gets them all a truck day, so all free of charge to uh, come and take, partake in that. So really, um, the kids love it, as you can see. So this is another one that she does, middle school baking programs. This is another very popular one where the kids come in to our rec center at the park and they bake an array of things. It could be cupcakes, it could be donuts, it could be anything, a Mexican day. Um, and as you can see, they uh, love doing that. So, PB basketball is here at the Town Hall Gym. Um, that again is, uh, she's got instructors running that and uh, that's a very successful program as well. PB is again, is three to five-ish for the grade groups. This is just uh, some of the programs at the rec center and as you can see in the back, the drawn pictures, Lynn Clemens is the artist behind all of that. Um, she drew the pictures and painted them and the children helped in some aspects of it and it's a great uh, backdrop to getting some pictures taken. <coughs> so now we're into the parks and field maintenance. Uh, in charge of that is Marty Tilton. Um, we did 5,140 hours of scheduling. We issued 265 permits. Those permits could be multiple hours of um, scheduling needed for the school or for a club team, but all in all. 
Uh, they've owned 93 acres, um, and some of the special projects that they worked on last year was the opening of the softball and multi-purpose field at the high school, Benevento, all the uh, Little League improvements that were done to get it to fruition, and uh, working with the town administrator and what have you for the AJK Turf Concession Bathroom Project. He's been uh, helping the town administrator uh, through that process. So um, these are the other parks we do, Benevento and Memorial Park, the Little League, uh, Chestnut Street soccer fields. These are two very, very popular parks. One's Little League, one's uh, youth soccer. Uh, Clark Park, that's another one. Those are swans from uh, the pond. And um, that's actually a very popular spot for us to permit out the um, sheltered picnic area. A lot of people like that. And some family events go there. There's our, um, there's our Ipswich River Park that we celebrated 20 years with last year. It is rated five stars by Google Reviews, and it was awarded the Best Scenic Place for Reading Magazine in 2017. Um, we get a lot of reviews, and, and uh, a lot of people come and uh, review it. So that's what Ipswich River Park um, has, a recreation center, soccer fields, little league, you name it, it basically has it. Um, people are, are amazed at the park when they go if they've never gone. So. Um, it is, it is quite the jewel. Um, this is one of the things when you, if, you, if you Google search Ipswich River Park, Google, your, Google reviews, you'll find this information and you can find out um, all the reviews and look it up. And it says when we open and close and stuff like that. So um, it's a really asset to finding out. People ask for directions on it uh, many, many times. So, and there's a drone shot that IT took and um, it's a really good shot. Um, Another field we do, Reed J. Mullen Field, which is very popular. It does men's softball, it does flag football, it does field hockey, ultimate frisbee, many uses. You can put it through many uses. There's a field that's being used. Town Hall field, same thing. It's used for all those things. Um, it's just uh, heavily used. All the fields in town are heavily used. Well, Parish Park, it's a passable little park for just sitting in a small playground and picnic areas. And Park Street has that only little basketball court. So there's our, again, there's the turf field, that wonderful shot that was taken. And there is the overhead. And that's what it encompasses, which is- There was uh, the old shed too. Go back one. See, the old shed, it's gone. Oh, yeah. The What's snack that? shack, it's gone. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, you see it, it's yeah. there. <laughs> there it is. There it is. There it is. Um, yep, there's the new drop. So we'll get a we'll get an updated picture, but that was the new drop that was on uh, March 20th. So um, 24 hour to. operation now, right? What's up? <laughs> You're gonna run that 24 hours now? Yeah, <laughs> I'll tell you. Um, so we've already met with Mike Conley, Mike, uh, Marty, and I, and we've already got a, a memorandum kind of in place to get the place opened and how we're gonna move forward with costs and sharing and um, maintenance and things like that. So they're uh, Wayne Hadiker and Marty and Mike were all pretty on board to uh, us moving forward uh, in a process, and then we'll just edit it as we go along, be a learning curve. But um, we, we're pretty confident we can get that running smoothly. So that's what we do for the community. Everything, Disney character, wine, food, relay. So if it's on there, we've been asked to either help or uh, assist in some way with um, things we have or our overtime or what have you. So a lot of these things we're involved in um, around the community, for sure. This is something that, again, Linda Clemens runs. It's a North Reading Welcomes Program. You get a bag um, when you um, move into town. And just recently on Community Connection, a person was saying how wonderful they thought it was because it's full of all kinds of business um, items, coupons, giveaways, and what have you. And to date, uh, Lynn ha and her staff have delivered over 500. And it's only been in existence for about three years, Lynn? Yeah, three years. So, and it's a fantastic program. She does a wonderful job. Staff does, and they're all in 01864 t-shirts when they deliver it. And the people are actually starting to get excited when they hear about them. They're, they're looking for them. So it's a great one. There's our barbecue concert series. As you can see, there's hundreds of people that attend these things um, and all waiting for it. That was probably a magician or something like that on that day. Uh, we actually have award-winning bands that came. Um, come, Andy Probst, she opens for Miranda Lambert. She's willing to come um, at almost no cost because it's one of her favorite parks. She gets a lot of money to open for it. So we get local dance groups to come in. This is how we get the word out, get the people to where we need to get them. We have the online registration. We have our website on the town. We have an Ipswich River Park website that 
Um, I take care of, we have a Facebook, which has 1,580 likes. We also have an Ipswich River Park page that has 749 followers. And we email blast to our 5,773 members when we need to, three brochures that are all cost covered by sponsored advertising, banners that you see around town, and obviously our town hall staff and um, people around the park. So we definitely work hard in getting the word out to uh, promote our programs and rentals and things of that nature. So now we get to the fun stuff. So this is um, the revenues and incomes. So for budgeted for FY19, the leagues we expect to bring in 126, 22, 220. Uh, Parks and Fields, 32, 4. Um, Enterprise, 7,500. It's a decrease. It's a concession decrease. We're not getting as many games over there from youth soccer. Most of the games are staying over at McGuire, so our concession's taken a hit. Um, so we're trying to work and see if we can find a better way to get our enterprise, um, our concession stand funding up. Uh, recreation is up 3075. Um, it's the summer skate program. It's just like wildfire. It's a great program that trips um, have increased, and there's some program decreases that are you know were just a, a makeshift in there to get them in the right category. But for the most part, uh, when summer programs are, are just that's the mainstay of that uh, money. So we have uh, budgeted um, a 473 620 and. Um, 19. This is the retained subsidy that um, Liz was talking about. At first, in your uh, packet, it probably said like 80,000 or something like that. It's now 57.4 um, that we're looking for for the request um, to fund the capital. The capital now, the IRP walkways is 37.5 and the rec center is 19.9. Those are paving projects, and Marty obtained a quote by EGA Paving, which our initial guesstimate back when we did the budget, um, we wanted to get it more real, and that's the real number. Um, uh, the subsidy request is listed there, 226045. It is listed there um, as 226045. So, and so that brings me to, uh, so there's our revenues, the retained that we'll need to fund the large capital, large capitals in the town, large capital, but they'll need to take that from our retained earnings and the subsidy request to fund the salaries of the directors. So that comes to the 757065. So in other words, we have personnel, services, supplies, other charges, small capital. So those light items on your budget shouldn't have changed. The 482191 stays the same. I moved some things around in that to make it stay the same. The services, supply, the other. The small, now we have small capital, 4,800. It was all lumped together with the large capital, so I put that in small capital. It's cameras um, and security things for around the barn and around the park that we think we can do. And indirect costs, 3,100, are just uh, Medicare fees that we transfer over to the town based on um, payroll. Large capital, that's the 57.4. That's the reason for it, the paving around the walkway and what have you. Um, want to get those things done. That's what the money and retained is um, supposed to do, is uh, take care of things that need to be done. And uh, we definitely feel that the paving at the rec center would be a big enhancement for our programs, look more polished, stop the dust from flying across the street, and paving the walkways around the park, uh, they are cracking and um, they need to be done. So, so there's the totals, revenue projection, the expenditures, the large capital, so we anticipate a surplus if things go as planned which we always hope they do. They usually go better than planned, but you never know with this weather coming off to a bad start, we're not sure. And we have a late start on Lynn starting our programs in the summer, so we're all hoping that everything will uh, balance out for us in the summer. So to conclude, uh, last year, um, this is where, you know, I know Liz said that uh, willing to fund the whole subsidy, but just to let you know that the subsidy of FY18 is only 0.32% of the total town budget, so that's why we ask you to um, fully fund the subsidy of this year. Um, we're three directors that work really hard, long hours, volunteer a lot, um, and we just really feel that um, it's um, a small amount to ask where it's just the three salaries and we take care of a lot of capital projects and all the supplies that are needed to run. We are an enterprise, um, but thinking that Hillview has a golf course, a function facility, and a restaurant, should be open, and um, the water department has water, and that's a human vital necessity. We have to have something people want, 
and that's what we work really hard for them to want what we put out there so it's um it's it's a tough one you know to try to get out there and make sure that you're uh, you know up to date and you know you've got everything going on and your instructors are you know doing everything right so um, we work really hard at that and we think we do a good job so that's why we would have asked so that we just want to show you we're just a tiny we're just like the little cut in the pie that's all we're asking for is that and we'd like that every year that support if we can have it so that's basically what that's saying so we're asking you to support to fully fund it and um, that is the end of my pretty show. So. Thank you. And questions for Fox and the Rec. Just what's in the retained earnings? The retained earnings? The current retained earnings are, right here. I believe they're 274. Close enough. Just they are. Two seventy four oh six four. That's the available balance. Is there a target that you're looking to retain in your retained earnings? You don't you don't want it to get below a certain level? Or it's been fairly steady. We've been um, yeah we've been pointing into retained every year for the last few years, so we've been able to do so, um, and it's been. For reasons that we're not putting, we're not putting cap. We should be putting back into the using, utilizing it for capital, and we haven't for the, really the last three years. So. So with the new concession stand, is there going to be a plan to put away some small portion of revenues for maintenance and upkeep and for the, for long the one run? at the high school? Yes, we're actually coming up with a plan. We um, we want a shared you know a shared opportunity and we mentioned that that um, when it comes to the new things that are going in there we don't want to put some of the older equipment in there it's not energy efficient uh, like the old coca-cola machine Marty and I decided it's just this big lug of a thing it's not energy efficient and it was I think it was given to us so we want to make sure that things go in there that are energy efficient we do have some uh, things at the barn that are put aside that he'll determine if they're worthy of going back and then um, when I talked to youth football and Marty, we talked to youth lacrosse and they said whatever it takes. So as far as maintaining things, yes, when it comes to maintenance on the, um, on the project, we're going to split any maintenance after warranty with the school. But when it comes to maintaining it to keep it clean, we already have a plan in place for that. What I'm talking about is long term. Long term. So taking some portion of all your revenues mm -hmm. coming out of the concession stand should be put a, put aside and maybe retained earnings are in some fund right for a rainy day you know if something breaks down in the next five years you're going to have the money to replace it it's very right. similar to how marty does all the um, sprinkler irrigation right. systems i know you put away a lot of money for those pumps because they're not cheap yeah. when one goes down you, you yeah, have nowhere usually, else to go so i just want to make sure we capture that in your planning so right. It's a nice facility, very expensive facility, and I know to replace things in there aren't going to get cheaper, especially right. when you have a lot of bathrooms with a lot of moving parts. Yeah, the grinder parts. parts alone, Marty knows that you know those things. Uh, they probably have a typical warranty of probably a year. You know, that's yeah. generally a typical warranty of them. Um, yep. They should last longer than that. I mean, I sold pumps for 25 yep. years. They should last longer, but after one year, even if they just go down for and they can be fixed. Marty knows as well. We've had them fixed. They go out. It can be eight, nine hundred dollars to be fixed. Yeah. So I don't need an answer tonight, but I would like to hear back on a long term. Right. How are you going? To just on. Their, their retained earnings supports the capital program, and they have given us a long term capital plan. A lot of it is to provide for what has, is going to have to happen at the current field over the next bunch of years. But those kinds of things should be covered in there. Capital plan, retain retain we but the concession stand, I don't believe, was ever included in what they've submitted thus far, right? Um, I don't know. I didn't read about yeah, it. Yeah, That's yeah, why I asked. Sure what the stand What's it that? belongs to them. That's why. That's all. I want to make sure they it gets increased. This operating right. Area. The, the groups get the money for what they get at the concession stand. The actual building and facility. We have said to the school we're willing to split the costs and we'll be on top of everything, making sure everything. Like even our our um, the one at Ipswich River Park, smaller facility, but yet it's really not a um, 
a broken down facility. It's been there since 09. They're really great machines and what have you. And we have the same thing, a septic system with pumps, and we've had to replace the floats and things like that. Marty does have a budget for things like that. Um, we do have a line item for turf needs. We can elevate that a little bit as well, as well as our banner program that we put into place um, can only be used um, per the school for uh, improvements, could be maintenance if so, but improvements to the turf field. We can't take the banner money and go to Ipswich River Park and buy a bench. So it has to go towards that. And we bring in, could be $10,000 a year from that uh, banner program. Depends, it goes here and there. Okay. So you. that gets put aside. I just wanna make sure we capture it, that's all. Right. So I don't think it's in there now. At least from what I read. No, it's it's that's what I said to Marty. There'll be some budget adjustments. This is our year of adjusting. Even yep. Michael said the same thing when it came to even uh, we've had porta parties there, and we all said, well, gee, we probably don't have any budget for we'll just say toilet paper and things like that. But we're going to turn our porta party money into the supply money. We both are going to do that and be able to buy in bulk, and um, we'll be able to take care of that. This is our year that we're going to watch it, peak times, what we have to order, how much we have to order. And then we're going to reassess it as we go along. And by the time it gets to that point in December, we'll probably already have a good guideline as to where what we'll need to put in our next budget to it'll be a year old and, and uh, make sure we can, uh, you know, keep it going and keep it perfect. Thank so, you. So. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Oh, Appreciate thank you. it. All right. The veterans is up next. That's on page 287 in the budget book. So why are you? Oh, lovely. You're coining me? Oh, no, you just coined me. That means you got to buy me a beer. All right, 287. Miss Sue Magner from the veterans office good evening everybody excuse me just last time we did this you gave us a quick update are you, you going to do that again or you just want us to get right into them with regard to the differences between the two budgets yes, yes I was thank you to speak to that. Did you yeah but i didn't, I didn't have my can you do it That's awesome. my office is which one do you have at the air force Clock. Coast Guard. So I guess I'll start with the challenge coins. Good, ever, good evening, everybody. Sue Magner, Veterans Department. Those challenge coins are from last year's budget requests that came in. I actually got them at a great price. We ended up with about a $750 less than what it was initially going to cost. They actually worked with the, um, the, um, what for? the, pop, the uh, P I got so many POEs on my head here, but um, what I had left over from the budget for, um, and incorporated that into the sales of these and worked really hard with the individuals that designed these up. So these are the challenge coins that are going to go for graduate to defender program. The uh, Graduate to Defender program, that's going to be an acknowledgement probably on an awards night. I'm still working that out with Superintendent John Bernard. But that was one of the things we kind of anticipated in doing that. And we would have somebody in uniform present the coins of those that have, have proof that are going into the military, um, as well as a certificate of acknowledgement and a thank you for them serving our country. It also enables me to be able to keep track of all our veterans going forward. Uh, the young ones so as we're finishing up on that honor roll up on the hill uh, we would be able to incorporate their names in as well thank you I just wanted to note um, for the veterans department's uh, FY19 operating budget uh, the town administrators uh, recommended budget differs from the veterans directors uh, submitted budget request for FY19 the difference is within personnel services and it is um, a difference of approximately $30,000 um, and it has to do with the request of a full-time 
um, administrative assistance for the Veterans Department. Okay. Ms. Magner, please continue. Just to give you a little excerpt on, on, on that part of it, I'm just going to touch base on that. This is very important um, in, in my, my belief and my need for the department. Back in 2007, we had eight clients on the rolls. Um, we had a budgeted amount of $38,000 at that point, roughly, with a transfer of 5,600 for a total of 44,000. In 2000, I'll jump by a couple of years to make it easier on you folks. In 2009, we had um, 10 on the rolls, 10 clients that we were assisting under Chapter 115. Uh, budgeted amount was 55,000, a request for a transfer of $1,300 um, that expended to 51,000 plus um, for the whole year. In 2011, uh, we ended up with 16 on the rolls and that was the year I came in on, on the jobs, just so you know. So we had 16 at that point now on the rolls. 76,000 was budgeted, 27,000 uh, was requested under a transfer, and it was $129,000 that budget. In 2012, excuse me, 2012 we had 18 clients on the rolls budgeted for 98.5, uh, transfer of 32.5, and that went up uh, another, tr roughly another 20,000 from the year previous year for 129,000 plus. 2013, we ended up with 26 on the rolls. 124,000 was budgeted, 95,000 was just transferred out of the um, emergency funding. 217,000 was the total that year. 2014 and 15 and 16, we were at 30, 34, and 36 clients. Uh, excuse me, let me go back. 2014, 2015, 30 clients and 14, 34, and 15 budgeted for 330,000. Um, we ended up expending out 217 on 14 and 240 plus on 2000. <laughs> Uh, 15. 2016, we were at 36, 310. We went down 20,000 to allow for some um, monies for that new transportation, uh, tra line transportation to kind of help out with the, uh, to try to level fund it. Um, so I was confident at that point, which it worked out, we were able to stay within the budget of that for 310, and that was 232. In 2017, we had the same budget. Um, for 310, uh, 37 clients, uh, no transfers again, and $247,000 is expended. To date, we have 37 on the rolls. Uh, we're budgeted right now at $280,000. No um, transfer amounts are anticipated, but right now, to date, without anticipating the medicals, outstanding medicals and dentals, eyeglasses, any other emergencies that may come about. We're looking uh, right now at $224,000. You are the best. Thank you for your patience. I'm, I apologize. Uh, click this. I like my keys better. Thank you. All right. As you can see, the organizational chart is just right now the veterans director's position. Um, and then typ the typical mission mission statement that I have is the mission of the North Reading Veterans Department is to advocate for the veterans, spouses, and independents. 
it's the responsibility of the agent to outreach through the community and educate them on the assistance and services available through local, state, and federal agencies. And the North Reading Department is committed to ensuring all veterans and their departments are served with the utmost courtesy, dignity, compassion, and respect while striving to render services and benefits in a timely manner. Thank you all to our veterans for your service and sacrifice. And help. This is that defender. This is the defender program that we uh, will put it that I uh, instituted uh, effective this year. Um, today, this year will be the first year we'll actually be doing this. I'm in the process right now of working on trying to find the veterans that have gone in in the past. I want to make sure they get coins as well. The new veteran spec program that we instituted uh, last year, courtesy of the state for one year, the licensing was covered. Um, that has actually helped me out immensely. Um, every form is in, within the program electronically, so I am able to go to somebody's house, which I have a couple right now that I'm working on. I'm able to go to their homes to do the hard copy documents um, as far as the, the uh, initializing the forms, have them sign everything. I'm able to upload it right there from their home, um, assuming we do have internet over there. Uh, but uh, that's the one thing that's great with working with this program. Um, I'm able to actually go into the program and actually see if anything's in progress, if anything got sent out. So if anything didn't get in the program or if for some reason it, I had a couple of them actually this week that went through the facts, never hit the regional office. They were asking where they were at and I said, they were sent out, came back saying you got them. So this is great because then they go into the system and, and they do their job. And it does save countless hours and it's accurate, provides accurate data and forms for filing. There's a lot of folk, excuse me, a lot of program features on, on this um, that uh, a lot of technical, you know, technical support communications. I got data tracking, claims management, um, scan documents. I can go in to see if any of these documents are missing. I've had cases that come in that are late or they haven't heard on them for like, you know, a couple of years. Um, before this got in incorporated, and it's great because I can go in there and say, hey, um, the document's not in there, let's get that scanned in. The cost of the license actually was $399. It's gone up effective uh, for this year for $450. So moving on, it's $450 for the year. Um, state assistance programs. We have numerous state assistance programs. Fuel assistance, state food, uh, the food stamp program, cell phones. When an individual comes in to uh, request for Chapter 115, they are automatically, um, and if they qualify, they are automatically qualified for the state fuel assistance program as well. Uh, in addition to the state fuel assistance program, I do have, I am working with the uh, Salvation Army. So if somebody is literally caught off guard and they, they ran completely out of fuel, um, and they've exhausted their fuel assistance, I'm able to um, assist them with another $200 voucher through the Salvation Army. Uh, same with um, food stamps. Um, I'm allowed to do up like $100 for a family. Um, in addition, we do Social Security um, applications. Um, if they're typically on these programs and depending on where their financials are, if they're under 2000 in their bank accounts and under 1700 for um, bringing in their um, income, combined income for, for an individual. It's like $134, that, that $134 for that Medicare B actually gets paid by the state instead of us. Um, and we have a lot of those coming through. But they're very sneaky about it too. If they're a penny over and the person is saving for their taxes, they lock them out. Uh, been a lot of filing of state annuities for um, veterans who have passed away with 100% disabilities um, for them as well, uh, for them. And then after they pass, then we have to reinstate it for on the uh, spouse's side. A lot of file of tax exemptions this year. Um, and a lot of senior home and assisted living placements going on too. I know you guys got a lot, so I'm kind of just kind of trying to brief as much through it as I can. 
um, the, the VA filing um, caseloads. Um, right now, I thought it was like at 40, 41. I actually went and counted, and I have 53 cases that I'm working on on VA between the disability comp agent attendance um, and the uh, dependency and indemnity compensation filing. Just to give you an idea what the DIC is all about, actually working with a veteran right now, currently, um, who is not given much more time. Um, he's never filed for disability compensation, so I'm rushing to get that disability comp in because what happens with a veteran who's at 100% or at any compensation, that comp goes with the veteran when the veteran passes. That does not go back, go on to, to the spouse. It doesn't carry over to the spouse. So what they end up, what ends up doing, happening is if the veteran passes away, from a service-connected disability that he is receiving a disability comp for, that wife, the wife has the right, the widow has the right to file for the DIC, which is about another $1,200 a month. But it has to be on the death certificate to match what's in the system. So if it didn't get in the system, then he never filed, she would never qualify for it. Um, adaptive housing, we uh, did some adaptive housing filing this year, this past year, um, as well as vehicle grants. Um, discharges, upgrading, uh, metals, um, putting in a lot for metals. A lot of the uh, families are looking for metals of their loved ones who passed away so the families can apply for them and request them. Uh, the uh, well checks we've had many this year, but um, more importantly, um, we were able to, I, I was able to um, get them the assistance they needed. I've got one that's now, that I had put in the, v, he got put into the VA system. Um, what I need to go back and kind of give you a kind of an idea of what happens. If, just kind of retract a little bit, and I apologize, um, on the, going back to those compensations, if the individual, as I was saying, was re receiving at 100%, he's about roughly around 3,200 a month. He gets his disability. He gets his he gets his um, social security. She's getting her social security. He passes. She the the, the disability goes away. That's 3,200 roughly 3,200 a month plus whatever his social security is. So now she's left with just collecting either hers or whichever is the greatest. So she's under, if she's under 1900 a month in Social Security, she's coming right back to me. So if I get, if I'm able to get these through in the time and manner that they need to be filed, then what happens is that then that individual can get on the DIC and at the minimum she may qualify for medical only, but the housing she would not qualify or the fuel assistance. Do you have, a, is there an expedited allowance process or compassionate allowance process for that? You mean like a retro? How quickly you can get that process. How, how quickly? <laughs> okay. Knowing so, that it takes a long well, time. Well, the, the DIC doesn't take as long to file if, you know, if it's noted in, in there. I've had a situation where I actually had to go to the doctors to try to get them to revert the what was on the death certificate and I had to go back into the system and like get him reassessed for what he had passed away from to get her her DIC. Um, but the DIC alone, it doesn't take that long to file. I mean, if, typically if somebody's in my office, I'll give you a perfect example, and I had one in the office the other day, needed to file the DIC, needed to file for the, um, the, the tax exemption, her markers and all that, and you're talking about an hour and a half with the individual. But when you're talking about the disability compensation, it's a totally different, different avenue. Some of them can literally take hours some of them could take weeks months to put together because you're now looking for all their medical documentation to come with it so there's filing the intent to file which locks in the date that saves the retro for the individual they have a year to put that together obviously if somebody's not doing well you're trying to push that through faster so um, one in particular I'm doing right now, and I literally got a stack about five inches deep of medical records 
that I have to go through, then they have to file and do an affidavit of the individual things that they are claiming. So they have to write their story, where they were, when it happened, how did it happen, how's it bothering you. And then you try to get the doctors to fill out a disability questionnaire to back up the documentation of the medicals to try and get this to fly through fast so they're not stalling on it for two and a half years. So it, it is, it, it, it's a lot of time consuming. Um, if it's one, one ailment, then it's not as bad, but you definitely, you know, we need to get affidavits from the family, especially when dealing with PTSD, or if they're dealing with any kind of ailment, say back issues or what, things like that, and how it's affecting them in their lives and how it's affecting the family. So there's a lot in, in, involved in it. So I can't even give you a time frame. I think the, the fastest, the, probably six hours, I want to say, was one of the quickest ones I did, you know. Okay. Any other slides? So this is, these are all the different things that are response, the office is responsible, the outreach um, going. Uh, where I work closely, as you all know, with, uh, with Mary Perrini Elder Services, um, nursing homes. Um, I work, uh, we work close with the SAVE team, um, the, v, uh, the VA, obviously, mental health, and with the medical end of it, too. I'm surprised on the transportation you didn't have the MVRTA stuff up there. The which one? The Merrimack Valley. I've got region. it in another area. Okay. Sorry. Um, on the mental health issues, I know we're all dealing with them in all different levels within the town. Um, one Even of the on this I board. Can, huh? Even on this board. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things I can say with the VA, I, we actually have a great team of people together. So I've worked with, you know, it's on several occasions um, I've had individuals that are dealing with it. One, I ended up actually physically taken to the emergency room because that was the best way, the best route to go at that time. We have a SAVE team that's incorporated and the SAVE team actually, what they do is they, um, our veterans themselves that have either been Gulf, most of them are Gulf War or, or now to the to current, OEF, OIF. They've lost limbs, they've been through all their mental health still going i'm sure they're still ongoing but to the point that they're stabilized to be able to help other individuals that are going through it and who best to talk to on a veteran is you're going to talk to another vet that's been through similar situations so that is one thing they are there 24 7 for them um, we have 24 7 obviously hotlines um the we work i work extremely close with the mental health department up at the veterans uh the va in bedford and they do have walk facilities as well to get the individual um, treatments that they need. My last resort is, is would be the would be the uh, the local PD, if, if, but they are you know we we're all there. Uh, I could go through all the functions on the on the office, but we'll be here all day. Um, training is is is. Oops, let me go back. Training is a huge part of, of our job um, because there's a lot a lot we learn um, through either networking or through the actual uh, conference courses that we take. Um, and it's always great to update and, and hear of the new things that are going on. Um, for instance, the VA, at one point you never had an intent to file, but now they have all that. So that's actually helped speed things up on the, on the VA and getting the uh, disability comps on their end completed. Uh, these are all the different uh, committees and resources that I work with. Um, NAM Knights is another one that's been helping out, uh, helps us out as well. Um, I actually had somebody uh, in here today that I actually worked with uh, the supportive services for veterans families, um, homeless, fa uh, borderline homeless, um, family members in the, uh, hot, the one of the, the breadwinner is in the hospital, been in there since February, early February. Um, they're anticipating another, at least another two months of them being in the hospital, and then on to um, uh, to the other um, uh, for occupational therapy, PT, that kind of thing. So right now they do not know how long he's going to be in there. 
So we're able to put him on, put them on the Chapter 115. There was no income in the house at all. Chapter 115, um, getting her set up with supportive services. Met with them today, um, and they're going to cover the last three months of her rent versus us covering the last three months of her rent, which is it was like $4,500. Um, Chief, the claims are 100% approval from the state filing um, with the 75 reimbursement. Um, the uh, assisted, we assisted a wheelchair bound veteran with an outside elevator for easier access. They actually initially had a um, stair lift outside, which wasn't working. Um, it was actually more of a hindrance than a help. So he, he had the elevator. Um, three homeless veterans were received uh, HUD bash vouchers and um, have been put, uh, their housing had been lowered on Chapter 115 because of where, with the help of the HUD bash voucher. And one of them is attending school, um, and in, instead of receiving the Chapter 115, she's receiving money from the VA, um, 2500 a month to go to school. So it didn't, she ended up coming off the rolls. She didn't need, require my help anymore. Uh, 31 burial markers to date, and uh, 43 claims to date have already been processed. Um, and the, between unemployability, DIC, and aid and attendance. Uh, I assisted one of the clients that uh, health department mandated um, debris, debris removal from the home. Um, financially, didn't have the assistant. They didn't have the ability to do it. Um, so this is where the veteran's gift account came in to help and assist somebody within the town. Um, in coordination with the Mystic Valley Services, uh, we're brought into, uh, we were brought in to assist four clients in need. Um, and incorporated, incorporated with the Salvation Army program for additional financial assistance, um, I assisted four families with uh, additional fuel at $800, um, uh, which was a cost savings for the town. And then I coordinate veterans, oops, veterans uh, day cards with the kids, work with them. Um, and they hand them all out to, on the Veterans Day ceremonies. Doing a lot of coordination with funeral directors and families, um, local, assisting them with um, guidance and uh, death benefits and filing for the death benefits and the markers. Um, as we all know, we're still um, in co uh, coordination with the DOD um, to uh, as commemorative partners of the Vietnam War. Uh, the annual dinner was a success this year. Uh, we had roughly about 175 people in attendance. Um, two Gold Star families there, um, Carlos Arredondo and Melita Arredondo uh, spoke, as well as uh, retired First Sergeant Bernard. Senator Tarr was there uh, to honor um, Major Timothy Callahan, um, retired U.S. Air Force and former Veterans Director for the Town of North Reading. Veterans Day ceremony was uh, really a, we had a good good crowd there this year. Um, and it was all indoors. Actually, kind it's kind of nice when it's indoors. I mean, I like the outdoors, but I kind of like the indoors too. Um, we had the Patriot Guard riders there all surrounded with flags at the, in the back of the stage and everything. And uh, phenomenal speaker and uh, uh, guest speaker, Major uh, Grant, uh, Major Grant, Regina Grant. Memorial Day Parade, uh, getting to come on that one now, starting to work on, on those, on that program. And transportation and coordination with the Elder Service, Town Administrator, Board of Selectmen, and the other dignitaries, and transportation for medical only has been established at a reasonable, affordable rate for those in need of transportation to and from the medical facilities. So far, this program is actually working pretty good. It just needs some tweaking on both ends, I can see. Um, but um, I think a little more communication and another, um, another meeting with them to just kind of fine tune things, I think we could do pretty well with this. 
objectives are obviously to continue with the uh, services for the town and the veterans, uh, continue providing uh, the filing for compensation, pension, aid and attendance. Um, the outreach support is um, extremely um, an important program that is required by the state and uh, coordinate more with the elementary school level um, to provide more education on veterans for the kids. Uh, probably my biggest workload indi indicator would be that of the, um, the workload, case workloads between Chapter 115 and the VA comp cases um, and for all the other different um, things that need to be filed, um, including all the the work that needs to be done on a regular basis in the office itself. Um, so the biggest issue I have right now, and I think we're all, we all know, is the need for an office assistant. Um, and maintaining the routine office procedures along with the growing number of state and federal cases that keep coming in. <coughs> Outreach is huge, transportation, still keeping that up there, as well as housing is another huge issue that we have. Going back, okay, so line items that uh, for an increase was for a non union administrative position, grade three, um, full time would be at 37, roughly about 37,000. The office supply increased, uh, line, number, line item 54200, an increase of uh, 150. Um, that is due to the increasing claims that need to be filed, although um, retrospects there, they can't take. 500, 200 to 500 pages in the veteran spec. So um, those have to be mailed out directly to regional. Uh, the subscription increase was for the veteran spec program. Um, an increase in postage obviously goes back to the additional need for the office supplies to um, allow for the mailings, additional mailings for other VA comp cases that have to go out. Uh, veterans benefit the increase is for 1400 for an anticipated increase of 5% for medicals and Medigap and the Medigap plans um, as I don't know if most of you are aware but the um, the increase in Medicare B went from 105 to 134 that was a huge increase huge increase um, transportation I decreased it by 2000 to allow for these to be imported in here for the, um, the office supply subscription postage and veterans benefits because we have the ring and ride currently in place. Um, so that is now decreased down to about 8,000. To 8, oh, there's the explanation and then some of our That's it, folks. Anybody have any questions? Any questions? We know you do a lot of work, Susan. Definitely um, you know, the need and justification for an assistant clearly is there, but at this time, I think the short term solution may be I know you have a senior worker that works for you, right? I, I utilize the seniors a lot. Problem is, is they're running out of hours, <laughs> right? Which is something we have on our agenda to discuss. And this would be a perfect example where we should increase the number of them and then also, also allocate them to you, not only with the increased number of hours but in number of people as well. I think because you really need more phone comment, right? People well, pick up the phones. In all honesty, no. <laughs> I mean, they they help. They what they do is help to kind of keep the traffic down in the office, if you will, making sure people sign in, answering the phone calls, but they're not able to answer what needs to be answered on the phones. So sometimes I don't get to calls till like either a couple of days later, depending on what it is, if it's an emergency, then I get, you know, sometimes I can't get to them until 3.30 in the afternoon um, because of the foot traffic that's coming through. What they, the, the assistant would be able to be able to start uh, doing the intakes for the veterans for the chapter 115 the intakes for the um, for the VA comp cases 
we have to import all their medicals into the system for chapter 115, okay? This is exactly what we do. You know those little pieces of paper you get from your prescriptions from CVS, the little ones? So what I have to do is take, I'll have people come in with like 30, 40 of them. I have to sit there and put them all on the copier, make a copy of them, toss those out, throw the next ones in. We get it. And I'm doing it for like 30, you know, 30, 30 some odd people. So um, those kind of things, I don't need to be doing that. I, I can have somebody looking at a marker and checking to see if the marker works. Excuse me. Can you use the mic? I'm sorry. <laughs> possible to scan those in so that they are right there with the rest of the client's records? I do scan them in after I have to copy them. Those are so small, they won't, the copier will, they'll get stuck in the copier. But I think th the no, point so is you that... You don't need to put them to a copier to scan them. Either way, I have to have the hard copy on file to send to them, to, to fax over to them. So either way, I'm, I'm copying so I think it. The point isn't, Matt. It doesn't matter how the job's getting done. The point is that it's an administrative work that eats up a lot of your time. I think you made your point there pretty well. I think we understand that. That's why I still believe another senior assistant can help uh, in this matter, at least short term, um, you know, because it is an administrative task. And the folks that work here in town, they do a lot of great work, and I think they could continue to do that for you. Any other questions for Mrs. Magner? Okay, thank you. We're going to go into uh, conservation, page 317. <coughs> yeah, 317. Five, five, five minutes? 15 minutes? Out? No, 805. Uh, 10. We're about 10 minutes behind, so maybe uh, go ahead. The FY19 Conservation um, Commission Department's uh, request is the same as the town administrator's recommended uh, budget <coughs> request. <coughs> Any questions? We still, we still have been using a consultant firm, right? We have uh, professional services, um, which is budget is which is part of the FY19 conservation uh, budget. We have an administrative uh, clerical position right. um, that's part time, and then we use um, consulting services. Yeah, because those haven't gone up at all. No. Yeah. That's good. Any questions? Okay. And the last one is administration. On page 44. <laughs> <laughs> the um, town administrator department FY19 uh, departmental request is the same as the town administrator administrator's recommended budget for FY19. Shocking. I would hope so. I'll turn it over <laughs> to the town administrator. Thank you. Thank you, Liz, for um, catching me up on some time there. That was good. Can everyone hear me okay? Great, so I put together a brief presentation relative to the town administrators, board of selectmen's, and town council's budget request for fiscal year 2019. I will go through the slides as quickly as I can. Uh, taking them in order, starting with town council, we use outside services uh, in the firm of KP Law. Uh, there's a requested increase of $15,500 to reflect the following, uh, $8,000 which would cover the 102 Low Road legal expenses which we may be able to reduce depending upon the pace of a closing uh, for a potential conveyance. We have proposals that are due back to the town um, this month and we expect a recommendation coming back to the Board of Selectmen later this month. 
$2,500 for KP law associated with a change in hourly rate that went into effect earlier this fiscal year and $5,000 that I'm recommending that we set aside for costs associated with our ongoing stormwater regulation legal action. For those in the audience who may not know, uh, in 2016, North Reading joined a, um, a multi-community group led, out of, led by the Massachusetts uh, Coalition for Water Resources uh, to um, seek to uh, lessen or stay the impacts of the most recently issued stormwater permit to which the town has been subjected. Uh, along the way, we continue to do the work required with the recommendation of the Capital Improvement Planning Committee to comply with the permit, but we are part of a multi-community um, action uh, seeking to um, uh, modify or eliminate those requirements, uh, which has not been uh, settled as of yet. However, the implementation was delayed a year from July 1st, 2017 to July 1st, 2018, um, and we continue our efforts towards uh, complying. This budget does not include the opioid litigation, which was covered uh, a few weeks ago uh, at, a, at a meeting here. Um, any legal fees associated with that litigation would be paid out of the settlement, nor does it include the secondary school building project litigation costs, which have been appropriated via separate town meeting warrant articles um, throughout this um, litigation, with the exception of the first year, fiscal year 2014, which came out of town council budget. Moving forward, if there are any questions on the town council budget, I'll move to the Board of Selectmen budget. Questions? Just a, a slide that I'll put up here that really is more a testament, a testimony, uh, or I should say a testament to the work that Jane puts in on behalf of the board. You can see all the licenses that are managed uh, out of her office on an annual basis. Um, we did not get, we ran out of time this afternoon to count up the number of meetings we had in 2017. That's why I see the blank spot there. Um, some of you know why. Uh, I, so I apologize for that, but uh, the board, as the board knows, we have meetings at least twice a month, more so during budget and town meeting season. Uh, and there's a, there's a significant amount of effort that goes into preparing for each meeting. I just want to recognize both Jane and Karen for their weekly efforts to do that. Just noting the long-term goals and objectives, um, these are taken directly uh, from um, the uh, strategic plan uh, as well as our ongoing discussions uh, here at the board level. Um, Long-term water supply solution we're all aware of, um, the permitting associated with it, um, the construction associated with it as well. We were initially looking to have construction underway this current construction season. However, right now that would be projected to take place in the construction season for calendar year 2019. And as I mentioned earlier, we are um, through the Economic Development Committee in the process of soliciting proposals for the redevelopment of 102 Lowell Road. I'm not going to go through the rest of this slide. This documentation is all taken straight from the strategic plan, which is up on the town's website. It's just a note for the many things that we have going on. Um, again, it goes on to a second slide as well. Um, if you want to read more about this information, it's all on the town website, right on the home page under strategic plan. Uh, there weren't any recommended changes for fiscal year 2019 in the board's budget request. Um, we do anticipate being able to absorb any increase in the Massachusetts Municipal Association dues in the dues and membership line is about $150 of latitude in that line. We have not received that number as of yet from MMA. If that changes, then we'll be back with a recommendation. Um, I expect that we'll have it before our next board meeting on April 23rd. But right now, we're not projecting a need to make a change. Uh, going to the, so if there are any questions on the Board of Selectmen budget, with regard to the Town Administrator budget, um, the goals and objectives during the year continue to advise the board related to the implementation of strategic plan objectives, facilitating in the way our office did in, for 104 Lowell Road, the conveyance of 102 Lowell Road, um, conclude the implementation of the new public safety administration structure, which has been really been ongoing over the course of this current fiscal year. Uh, in conjunction with the police and fire departments, establish the organizational framework and begin transition to a civilian dispatch subject to collective bargaining and complete the civil service hiring process for the permanent fire chief, uh, which began um, in January. The budget changes, just a, a few changes that reflected the trends that we saw. First, uh, repairs and maintenance reduced $750 to reflect the actual cost that we've incurred. 
Similarly, we had to increase advertisements by $600 to reflect actual costs. Uh, professional services was requ requested to be increased $10,000 for uh, potential social media or communication services. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. And then uh, request to in increase other charges and expenses by $1,500 to reflect the trend. Um, we had a fiscal year 2018 reserve fund transfer from the Finance Committee, which we're very grateful for, that was associated with the JT Berry property. We did not carry that forward into fiscal year 2019. As I mentioned earlier, we've got some additional funding set aside in the town council budget that would address any legal action that might be required um, for that um, for that project and it, much as was the same for the compensation towards 104 low road for 104 low road real estate brokerage services that's handled at the time of closing through the 102 low road uh, closing experience so we don't need to fund any appropriation for that and Mr. Chairman, if I remember correctly, TR Associates is not billing us for consulting services for 102. That's correct. So we have no need to carry additional costs for that. So just going back to professional services, uh, there's been uh, a bit of discussion amongst some of the board members uh, and quite a bit of communication that we followed relative to uh, social media uh, and communications as an avenue for us to provide information to the town. A couple of board members have been very uh, helpful with regard to conveying information. At the time the budgets were being present, uh, submitted in uh, earlier this calendar year, um, but looking at what our options were, this was intended to address um, some services that may be available to help us with an overall media communication strategy. Some of you may be aware that the police department currently is utilizing a, uh, an on-call service, uh, it's John Guilfoyle Public Relations. There's a number of public safety agencies in Massachusetts that are now using that firm for purposes of press releases or other media communications. The idea would be that there'd be a similar model that would be um, in effect and available for uh, broader town hall type news. That was the thought of putting this type um, request uh, out there. Uh, again, um, something that has continued, that even as recently as the recent um, winter storms, we've kind of evaluated what's the best way for us to communicate. We've got some great feedback from the board members as well. Um, and we certainly recognize that Facebook seems to be a significant avenue for us to be communicating with folks. So this may allow us to pursue that. Uh, there could be other options and other ways for us to implement it that we've had some discussion of as well that may not necessitate uh, funding. But at the time the budgets were due, I felt a bit of an obligation to at least put something in there to start the, uh, the conversation for us for planning purposes. That's the end of the presentation um, relative to uh, the town administrator's budget. Happy to any questions, questions for the town administrator, FinCom? Do you have any questions? No. Nope. And then I think that's anyone. I'm just glad he agreed with the proposed budget. <laughs> What's that? You agreed with the pro with the proposed budget. That was very good. I agree with myself <laughs> occasionally. Okay. Do you have anything else, Michael? Uh, no, sir. Not? We can go into the. Review the FY 2019 revenue and expense plan. But before that, are you going to pull up that? Okay. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to run through a quick presentation. It's about three slides. What I'd like to ask is if I could just get through the first couple slides. Let me go through the entire thing, and then when we get to the summary slide, we can open it up for discussion. I think when you you hear the whole story. Um, then you can look at it in its totality, and then we can decide how we want to go forward from there. So if you mind going to the first. I, I don't mind, but I would just note that the, the revenue and expense plan that is in the meeting packet is not changed. It reflects the last conversation we had with the financial planning team. So we've not incorporated anything that Slepin Prisco is going to review in that document. Right. And just so everyone knows that, um, you know, Kate and I worked on this. We pulled this together. We presented it to Michael and Liz, and then we presented it to the chair and vice chair of FinCom and we've edited a little bit more and we're here tonight now we have members of the school committee here and we have the superintendent that joined us this evening because and I promise them I'm gonna get them out of here before tip off for the basketball game so uh, I appreciate your patience but if you would like an opportunity to speak afterwards all I'm gonna ask is if you just wouldn't mind coming up to the podium to get recognized so the folks at home can hear you on the microphone so these are the areas of consideration. And the first one is uh, we've spoken with Liz a little bit about where the money is now and what we're doing with it. 
so we have almost $20 million and it's in an account that's probably doing less than 1%. And so she's looking into uh, CD options, 12 month options right now uh, with some of the banks that she looked at and the best rate that we found is 1.94%. And so our thought was being conservative, we take about $15 million of that money for a year since we're not gonna be really going um, uh, aggressively yet at the storage or any other things uh, that we haven't decided what to do with that money yet. So we figured well, let's put it into an investment so we have some increased revenues which we believe will generate about $290,000. And in the summary, when you say I get to that slide, we're gonna recommend using $250,000 of that, two potential 290 in the investment as included in the revenue plan. The next thing is the health insurance. And we've been working real hard, going back and forth, and uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield initially started out with about a 14.3% increase, went down to about 12 and a half, and we've I'm mean, going to officially come to a conclusion, but it seems like we have a handshake agreement now to lock in at 10.5%. And using the PFA, which is the strategy we presented last year, has worked out pretty good. And with the totality of putting those two things together, with the 10.5% increase, using the PFA, we budgeted at 7.5% in the revenue plan. And I think we can get this down to somewhere, potentially around 4.5%, 4%. So that would free up, what we're suggesting is freeing up about $200,000 that we don't have in the revenue plan now based on using that strategy, incorporating the PFA savings into it with the lower rates, premium rates from Blue Cross Blue Shield. That brings us to the next bullet, which, oh, sorry is the if you looked at the revenue plan you only saw about a ninety thousand dollar increase you know we had a thirty million dollar sale of a piece of property and it only generated ninety thousand dollars in new revenue and i know a lot of us looked at that and just said something just doesn't feel right so we have met with the assessor and we've gone through this and we're still going to continue to look at it but i think at a quick review the assessor would not disagree that there's probably about another $43,000 in value that should be added to the revenue plan based on that property. But we are seeking to bring in an, a consultant to do another analysis on that, but at least we feel confident, and the finance director has supported this, that the, that increase should go from 90000 to 132000 which is another $43,000 that we didn't have in the revenue plan uh, up to our last meeting. Next slide. <coughs> Another idea was you know, we have the JT Berry funds and all along the economic development community kept coming back saying going through the sale partnership model. We see us right around the 16, 17 million dollar mark. And in the end, we far exceeded that and we got the 20 million dollars in net proceeds. So I thought was we have some capital expense, we have some debt expense to free up some additional cash, our recommendation would be to take $200,000 of that Barry proceeds money, the one-time money, and pay down the debt expense by $200,000 to free up additional $200,000 in the revenue plan. And do the same thing with the capital. Use $200,000 of the Barry funds one time to pay down those expenses to free up another additional $200,000 to give us a total of $400,000. But the good thing about this is, I know no one likes to use one-time money this way, but one, we've exceeded what we thought we were gonna get. Two, when you look at the projections for the tax revenue in the following years, it far exceeds what this number is. So even though we're using it one time, it's not like we're gonna have to come back next year and use one-time money again. We should have the increased revenue in the plan to make sure we can afford whatever we're going to pay for this year, we'll be able to pay for it next year through the tax revenues. Proposing applying the 200000 in free cash as well as we've done every year going forward, we've always applied some additional free cash at this stage in the process. So you go to the summary slide. So as you can see, it all comes together. 
those six proposals, it gets us up a little bit over a million dollars. That's the good news. The bad news is, as you can see the little fuel tank over there on the bottom left, you know, we've gone through this and over and over and over again, really trying to figure out where we could try to generate, yeah, generate more revenue because we know the schools have well over a million dollars uh, over um, overrun, and we have over a hundred, uh, about five hundred thousand dollars over budget as well. Well, if we went with this proposal, you see the splits. It'd give the schools another seven hundred twenty-one thousand dollars, and it'd give the town three hundred seventy-two thousand. And so that's the proposal. I know it was. I went through that pretty quickly, but I want to take the opportunity now to just open it up for discussion, concerns, other ideas. And I wanted to present it tonight because we're going to the finance planning team meeting tomorrow, but I thought it would be fair to the board members since we're proposing to use some one-time money or bury money, it wouldn't be right to do that in financial planning team without getting your uh, honest opinion and feelings on that. And uh, so I'm going to open it up for discussion. Mr. Misery. Michael, the, uh, if we're looking at the uh, revenue plan and then the expenses, the, the differentials right now don't include what you've proposed. Is that That's correct? correct. Okay. That's all I want to know. Because we didn't want to, we, we felt that we didn't want to do that yet until we had this discussion and get the buy-in of the board members no, to make I, sure you were comfortable with I'm this just approach. Looking at the, the Delta and I'm trying to figure out if you yeah. put them in or not. That's a good question. I'm sorry I didn't highlight that in the beginning. Mr. Schultz. Yeah, and I, I think the $43,000 figure for the additional Barry, I think that's a conservative estimate. I think personally think that could be much higher, but I think that's a. I think there's a little more money there, possibly, long term too. Um, and I believe we are trying to get some some support to help us analyze that, Mr. Schultz. So we are. Yeah. Hopefully, we can confirm what you're saying is true. Mrs. Horbert, do you want to add anything, or um, if you could use the mic, I'd appreciate well, it. Thank you. Uh, both. Um, Ben, my vice chair, and myself were, uh, were in a meeting with uh, uh, you people and the TA and, and Liz, and uh, we came away from it um, thinking that it was not a bad solution. No one likes to go into one-time monies, uh, but I think that we understand. Now, the rest of the finance committee is hearing this for the first time tonight. Um, I think we understand that um, going forward, there'd be an increase uh, tax revenue from the Berry property uh, in FY20, uh, and that uh, there'll also be, but anyway, so it will be less of a problem next year. Uh, so I think that uh, Ben and I and Don Kelleher, for starters, are in support. Uh, we also feel that it's really important that everyone understand that some of the found monies that per, you know come forward in April and early May are basically here. Yep. You know, when when the budget first is done, there really aren't firm numbers on health insurance and a variety of other things. Okay, so typically in late spring, there are savings that we discover that can be passed on to both the municipal government as well as the schools. That's not going to happen this year. This is it. It's like an early Christmas present, so to speak. And, and I think that that plus the fact that this is one time and it's limited to 400000 is very important for everyone to understand. Mr. Keller. Um, just, just a couple of things. I, I am concerned about using one-time money. I understand what we're doing. It could be a slippery slope, and I'm, I'm concerned about that. Um, it isn't a lot of money coming out of there, but it's, 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 it's opened up a spigot that may be difficult to shut off. Uh, the other thing I'm wondering is why you're limiting this, the CD to $15 million. I, Do we have a use for that of $5 million or a good portion of the $5 million within the next 12 months? And even if we're not sure, you can break a CD and you, you're going to lose some of the, the earnings on it. But if you yep. don't break it, you get the earnings. So it might be, might be prudent to invest more than $15 million as long as you've got insurance coverage on it. We could. 
when we start looking at the storage options potentially ahead of us, and once we get through this water and we figure out where we're going with that path, we may need some money. If we want to do a quick <coughs> reaction, start to invest in this storage plan, we may need some funds for that. And that's why the thought was initially to leave the roughly $5 million there to help us to get some additional studies going to keep, continue to keep the pace on storage to explore an option. So depending on the water, which one that would be. So if it's we go with Andover and we want to now start to work with Greater Lawrence Sewer District, we just wanted to have some funds available to get those programs rolling. You could do the other five and one million increments and you know, as I say, you break it. Yep, we could. You you lose some interest, but if you don't break it, you, I use you've a very it. conservative approach here. And and I want to go back to what you're saying about the one time funds. Believe me, I don't like using them either. But when I went back and I had the finance director tell me her projections and rough projections for the future years with the tax revenues, it's there. It's coming. It's not like we got to figure out this gap next year and then we, we don't have it the following. We do. We should see somewhere up to close to $700,000 in new revenues that we potentially don't have now. And so it will s certainly fill in for that $400,000. I feel very confident in saying that. So I don't want us to open up this bucket and then keep taking from it every year. We shouldn't. But again, uh, you know, I don't make the decisions. We do, we're trying to do that tonight for this conversation. And if we just don't have the stomach to do it, then we don't. But I'm certainly open for any other ideas. As you can see, the schools are sitting back there, and they still have over a million dollar deficit, and we need to work with them tomorrow in our finance plan team meeting. And if we don't go with this idea, then I certainly need a few others. Anything else? Okay. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Rourke. <coughs> Ms. Rourke, sorry. So the proposal about potentially taking the 15 and using all 20 or 19, I think we have 19 and change. Um, you know, adding another 4 million to that would certainly increase that revenue number. Um, would you have some concern with that? Do you feel like we're taking on some risk there? My only concern um, with increasing the amount we invest would just be uh, liquid cash availability if there was something that came up that we needed to appropriate those funds for a particular capital item. I'm not sure what that item may be right now. You know, we just never know. Um, currently, the uh, funds um, are earning uh, one and a quarter now. Last week it was one, um, and we just received an email that now they're earning one one quarter. Um, so, you know, compared to the the two percent with a CD, you know, the rates are increasing. So, if we were to invest now, um, all of it, we may not have a chance to then invest another piece of it with a higher higher rate of return, as rates are increasing, as we can see. I mean, we went from uh, point eight to one to one and a quarter and that's just in a, a regular money market account so the cd rates are increasing as well you know it just depends on what what we want to do um and so we can evaluate that but prior to investing the you know whether it's 15 million or 17 or or 19. Um, but i think the idea of investing the 15 million and then do one in one million dollar increments in the other four is a good strategy um, that way, if we have to liquidate one million at a time for, for reasons, then we'll yeah, do Liz that. makes a good point, though. We could be seeing 25 basis point increase yeah. every quarter, and dollar not, cost not, averaging. Yeah, not 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 at all. Yeah, not at all out, out of the realm of possibilities. Yeah. The Fed is, is is positioned to do that. So, um, yeah. I think you know, getting getting the most we can out of it, putting it putting it to work, is the, is the issue. Thank you. Mr. Schultz. Like, I believe you had a question? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair. Oh, Dan. <coughs> Didn't see you back there, sorry. No trouble. Um, back on the insurance cost increase, yes. um, could you explain PFA, how extraordinary the 10% increase is? And, you know, is this like a, seems like a point of concern to me, and we're doing a lot of extraordinary things for, sure. for one of the big cost drivers here. That, mm -hmm. If you could help me understand that. Sure. Through you, Mr. Chairman. So with the advent of the participating funding arrangement, or PFA, 
which we implemented the beginning of this fiscal year, July 1st, 2017, there are really two components for all of our active employee uh, employees who are drawing health insurance from the town. It used to be that they just purchased health insurance from the carrier directly. We paid 70% of the premium and the employee paid 30% of the premium in the case of the HMO. Um, it's a different split for the uh, PPO or the legacy uh, plans. But in, with the PFA, we effectively are buying a higher deductible plan from the carrier. And in, the, in our case, it's Blue Cross Blue Shield. And we uh, basically self-insure the difference down to the deductible level that we want to offer our employees. So we buy a plan that's uh, at $4,000 deductible, but the plan um, level for the employee's family might be $900. Um, I think those are the right numbers. In 2004, an individual from the plan we buy from Blue Cross, but using the PFA, we offer a benefit at the $300 level. So the, the PFA basically ensures for the middle uh, amount, the difference between the two deductible levels. That policy doesn't increase, the premium doesn't increase at the same rate as the health insurance itself. So the health insurance is increasing, as you see here, projected to increase at 10.5% from Blue Cross Blue Shield, but the increase for the, uh, the reinsurance, if you will, between the, di the difference is far less than that as a percentage standpoint. So that helps serves to reduce the actual experience that we see in the premium. There are some other things that we uh, are looking at relative to the design of the participating funding arrangement. We took, admittedly and purposefully, the most conservative approach in the first year of it, but um, I think some of the data that we're seeing and we've been uh, discussing with the Insurance Advisory Committee in the earlier part mm -hmm. of this year and we'll discuss at future meetings uh, is uh, looking favorable for us and provides us an opportunity to further reduce the percentage increase. So we don't have a final number on that right now, but I would say that the, the news has certainly um, put us in a position where we have a number of options available to us right now because of the, of the success of the PFA. Did that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Not only does it help us with this New, new year, but it also allows us to have a retained money for the future years as well. So we're not going to use all that savings. We're going to continue to keep growing that fund to get it significantly higher <coughs> over time to control, try to control these costs. Because you can see they continue to go up at double digits. And we don't see that changing anytime soon. Just to add to that, Mr. Chairman, one thing that the Finance Committee and the attendees at town meeting will see is that the, uh, we expect to be asking town bless you. God bless you. We expect to be asking town meeting to approve the creation of a stabilization fund into which funds would be uh, transferred uh, associated with the savings from the PFA uh, as basically a buffer against future in, uh, increases in costs. That's something that. Uh, you know, that we kind of thought would be a, the proper way to handle things moving forward. We had some initial discussion with our insurance advisory committee about that last year. We'll have more discussion about it at a future meeting with them. We're well. one of the first communities to ever take on this approach, but I think you can see it's paying dividends. It's really working. And we have a good broker. We have a good um, participating funding agreement consultant that works with us. Uh, we have a great team, and I think you're seeing the benefits of it. And, I ho and I'm very hopeful that in the out years, you'll see it to continue to be more beneficial as we go along. Any other questions on this? Board members, any feedback, concerns? Yes. I, I too, am troubled by using, you know, the one-time fun aspect of it, but I, I, it isn't lost on me. The number one, I'm not gonna say it's a windfall, but we got more than we thought we were gonna get, and that's not something we're gonna have every year. And I, I wouldn't be for it, but for the fact that we know we have the property tax revenue coming in future years, and that's established. That's the only reason I would vote for it. I, I think it is a slippery slope. <coughs> I, somebody said oh, yeah. that I agree with that. I think this this one time I would vote for it, but I, I we just gotta be very very careful with this. Is what I would say. Mr. Misery. Michael, last year, knowing what was going to come this year, I had looked at, instead of using that money, borrowing from it, mm -hmm. and had put a plan together where I think I started at $1.2 million, and then it went up 100000 each year. Mm -hmm. And over three years, we were borrowing, not that amount each year, because as, as they build out, obviously, there's revenue coming. And then when he went past the third year, the revenue was such that he would start to pay it back. 
know, using the tax revenue <coughs> to pay back the money you borrow. Yep. So you would do it in the form of using using the uh, borrowed money which you're borrowing into the capital which would reduce the debt service and the reduced debt service would allow more capital tax revenue to fund the, the budget and bring those budgets together. So that was an approach. Yep. I don't know if you had I did. No, I it. and I went back and looked at it. I knew you sent it to me. I went back. We did look at it. And and it is a good strategy if we had to have a multiple year need for this money. But this one time, this one year, I just thought it was a lot of administrative effort. I spoke with the finance director on it, and we just felt that this was the cleanest and easiest way, uh, knowing that the future years we see the increased revenues to offset this delta next year, rather than get into a sort of a lengthy administrative tracking and then repaying process. Um, this was just a lot cleaner, uh, I felt. But I'm a t town administrator or the finance director. I know you've studied that approach, and if you had any concerns or any questions about it or you want to explore it again, we just felt that this, I thought, based on the time that we're in, it worked the best. I, I think, through you, Mr. Chairman, one of the things that we discussed in the, our informal conversations was uh, the amount by which we exceeded our projected revenues on this. Talking from the very beginning of a 16 to 18 million dollar projected revenue stream, and um, in the end, we ended up being wired over 20 million dollars in December of last year. So, I, I think that's a, a bit of where some of the, the comfort in this approach came from, as opposed to where we may have thought we were going to end up a year ago. <coughs> yep. You know, we find ourselves in a really bad situation for some reason in the out years, Mr. Masseri. I certainly think that's a great strategy, um, but I think that the town administrator we just hit on is the real key point for us was when we went back and looked at it, looked at our projections, and we exceeded it by almost you know, three or four million dollars. I, you know, I think this just seems like the simplest solution. Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, I, I, I too am uh, weary of, you know, spending one time revenues in this fashion and last year when Bob worked on his spreadsheet there I, I kind of like the idea and we have done it in the past where we basically borrow from ourselves and pay ourselves back and retain the principal amount for future uh, expenditures uh, to leverage against uh, down the road and I, I think it's it appears to me that, it, that it's a more than just a, a one year deal I'm not so uh, sure that you know the additional tax revenue that's going to be generated through Pulte, you know, through uh, ongoing development, is really going to you know exceed this and keep pace with um, revenue needs or expenditures, expenditure growth. So uh, I don't mind spending a little more money on borrowing against our own funds and ensuring that we pay it back. I think that sets a, uh, a more sound tone for future use of the revenue, you know, where the expectation isn't infusing, you know, quick uh, infusion of cash to, you know, plug a hole. Uh, and I don't disagree that there's going to be increased revenue coming along. It's just, you know, we keep our fingers crossed, crossed and hope that, uh, you know, the uh, need for housing, you know, continues at the same pace that uh, Pulte's projections, uh, and again, they're in the business, um, are correct. But, you know, even through their presentations, you know, they're looking to phase this in over five years, and it could be longer if things cool down. So if it cools down, again, our revenue stream then cools down. So you know, I just think we have to take, take a, a cautious approach, and I understand this, and, I, you know, it, it works. Uh, but to me... I like to make sure that we pay ourselves back first. Pay ourselves first and pay ourselves back first. And uh, you know, so you know, I endorsed uh, the proposal that Mr. Masseri put together last year uh, as a good sound plan to you know, forecast what our revenue generation was going to be and then uh, borrow against that with our own funds and pay ourselves back. And then we still retain the principal amount. Yeah, you know, we got an additional windfall, you know, whatever it was, $4 million plus. Uh, 
Plus, we also had somewhere within that settlement, you know, four hundred plus thousand dollars in additional uh, tax revenue that had to be paid by Pulte to us. I'm still not sure where that sits right now in our revenue projections or plans, uh, but that might be the money because that's actual money that uh, you know, gets converted to free cash later on. But it's not tied to necessarily the proceeds, other than they were required to put the money up front. So um, I understand the proposal. I like it, you know, as far as uh, an approach. But I, I just think uh, a more cautious and conservative approach would be to uh, to borrow, pay it back with the additional revenues as it comes in, and then you know it's, you're five to seven years out before it's all paid back, maybe. But the principle is preserved. And uh, we have an awful lot on our plate coming forward, for sure. And uh, I think we can use it down the road in that time frame, you know, five to ten years. So. We can continue to explore that option, but I was hoping the finance director would be here for this conversation because I'm not too sure from the uh, administrative standpoint how it, that's going to work. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a little more administrative work as far I as tracking. It's a lot more, but that's okay. I think we need to hear from It's a lot more, but as far as what you end up in the end is a repayment to yourselves of the principal amount that's retained. Um, I'm, are we even sure that's even legal to do with that money? The way we're using it? There are, there are ways to, to do it. Well, I don't know. Very specific on how we can use that money, so. I think, and again, I'll, uh, I'll be measuring my comments because only the finance director can speak with the full uh, expertise of it, but there are some, some restrictions that we face with regards to the use of those funds, and those same restrictions, I think, would come into place with regard to um, a borrowing scenario uh, similarly to how they come into place with the um, scenario that's outlined here. I think that the bigger concern was more, again, the, the housekeeping associated with that and mapping that out. Cue the finance director. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I took a phone call related to health insurance. And I apologize. So not a problem. So the discussion. Um, so Mr. Maseri brought up that he, you know, his proposal. Yes. He wants us to reconsider that option and wasn't sure. I wanted to understand what the uh, pros and cons of that again were. My understanding was that it's significant. Um, administratively it would be a little bit a lot of work actually and I'm still not sure if it's even legal based on the way it was the way I read it and the way I understood it so we couldn't borrow from the sale of town owned land and then put funds back into the sale of town owned land fund since they are not proceeds from the sale of town owned land we would have to take free cash and put it into the debt capital stabilization and that would have to be the, the offset. But we can't take free cash and put it into the sale of town owned land fund to repay. So, you know, you'd have to be creative in how you would pay it back um, if we were going to do something like that. But it would be similar to, you know, what we do every year for the capital improvement plan. We take free cash. We have a plan that says, okay, at June and October town meeting, we're going to put in, you know, X amount of free cash to the capital debt stabilization fund in order to fund our future year's capital plan. So it would be the similar thing, you know, at, at June town meeting of uh, 2018, we would take out $400,000 from uh, sale of town on land. Though those funds would be used to offset the debt service budget as well as to pay for capital items. Now, fast forward to 2020, 2021, when we're receiving tax revenue for the buildings that get built, we would then, that would flow and we'd have to generate free cash and we'd have to take the free cash and put that into either a newly created stabilization fund or the debt capital stabilization fund, but we cannot take um, you know, it doesn't even have to be free cash. It could be any any source of funds, but we can't put that into the sale of town-owned land. The sale of town-owned land is restricted to proceeds from the sale of town-owned land, whether it's a small parcel of land or a large parcel of land. So you, if you wanted to come up with some type of plan like that, it would have to go into another uh, fund. That's okay. I'm just explaining, right. you know, that... Yeah. So it can be done. It's, it's just one bucket. You're not going to put it back into that... 
specific fund. Right? No, it's so one bucket to the other. Into a savings account somewhere else. Right. Please. So we're talking about to avoid the use of four hundred thousand dollars of those funds for something that's appropriate, debt service capital. We're going to borrow money, so we're only taking a little bit of that. It's a band-aid year, we all acknowledge that, to cover what we all know is a deficit which we face each year. Pretty substantial from the school each year, and somewhat substantial from the town each year. And we're taking that 400, appropriately using it towards these two things. That's a, that's a perfectly, perfectly proper use of that, just for this one year, mm -hmm. versus borrowing and setting up two, three, four years down the line to restore that back to somewhere else. To restore that back to where would we be restoring it back to? Back to the JT <coughs> Berry Fund to use it? No. No, 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 it, no, it would need to be restored to either a newly created um, a stabilization fund or it could be restored and put into the debt capital stabilization fund. Um, and then, you know, just it can sit there. It could go into the town stabilization fund, which is just a general stabilization fund that we do not draw from. Um, the debt capital stabilization is set up to pay for capital, similar to the sale of town owned land, which is, you know, the berry proceeds. Um, so it, it, it's one buck or the other that you're going to take it from. However, you have to find a way to generate that free cash just by bringing those buildings on the tax rolls is, is not necessarily, we would have to under budget by 400,000 to achieve uh, free cash. So I you have to be careful with that scenario. Right. That's that one's. And I think, if I, I think the, I think the plan when it was proposed at that time was brilliant because we needed something like that. We had, didn't end up using it because we had, didn't end up needing it. But now we have an alternative here. And I think we should keep that plan, you know, as a, a possibility of something down the line in the next year or two fiscal years doesn't turn out the way that we expect it to turn out. But we're banking upon this JT Berry property and we already know right now that the calculation of the assessment is probably lower than it should be right now. Mm -hmm. And that as these buildings come online, it's going to get revisited every time something new happens. New, it's already permitted, like Selectman O'Leary said last week. So that should have, or the, the last meeting, that should have been taken into consideration in terms of the increase in assessment. So that was looked at, and we already know now that's going to bring us in more likely than not, another 43,000. Yes and no with the permits. We just need to be careful with that because it all has to do with the date of when those p permits were pulled. Um, so I know that a permit was p p pulled for uh, building number one, but it was just recently. So that does not have any effect on the new growth that we will see for FY19 for the land value. The new growth for FY19 is based upon the land value and the wastewater treatment plant. The permits that were pulled for the build buildings will be in FY20. We won't see that in FY19. So it, it all depends on the date of when those permits were pulled. Um, but the zoning change comes into account for the land value and whatnot. So that's what we, I understood his comment right. to be. It's zoned now. It's permitted. Yes. To yes. Allow we, we'll, we'll, we will see an increase in the land value. Um, we, we know that. Um, but with the buildings coming online, we, we need to wait and see what they're going to, you know, sell for and those type of things. That's all going to be a, in a built out plan. Um, and, you know, we'll be able to know what the new growth will be for those properties. You know, it should be much larger than the land value new growth. Um, but again, even with that new growth coming and the tax that in those buildings coming on the tax rolls, that then becomes built into the, the levy. And that doesn't flow to free cash necessarily dollar for dollar. Right. So that's just something we need to keep in mind. So I, I'd like to ask <coughs> you your opinion of that strategy Mr. Masseri has come up with. It. Your thoughts in comparison to this one. If you could use the mic, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. 
Um, I think we'd have to talk with the uh, town finance director and discuss it as a finance committee before I wanted to venture an opinion. Um, off the top of my head, I think the big decision is whether or not you're going to take out $4,000. How or if you pay it back is a separate discussion as far as I'm concerned because we really need to get working on the upcoming budget well, the current budget for, for FY19. Okay. So I'm not really sure that whether it gets paid back or whether it's a one-time withdrawal um, would change how we, how we set up the new revenues. Michael. Yes, Mr. Monsieur. When I put that together last year, obviously we didn't have as many tax as we have today. And I think it was based on a build out from Pulte over three years and the revenue flow was such but it could be adjusted I think what I'd recommend at this point let's go forward with the plan you have have your meeting and see where you really are with respect to the budget gaps yeah. because what you're proposing isn't going to close those gaps and therefore the school department and the town are going to have to make some adjustments All right and take a look at that and then let's come back at our next meeting and decide if there's a better way of closing the gap then or maybe you're going to have to increase the amount of money that you're taking off the top and putting it into the budget process well we can certainly do that but i certainly think this is all said the clock's ticking. We've got to come up with a solution. And you know, I'd like to hit the ground running tomorrow with an updated financial plan with this scenario built into it, and let's go to work. Let's try to figure out where, that, where everybody ends up. Uh, we certainly can come back here and present the level of deficits and what the challenges will be based on the use of these numbers. Uh, I know the town administrator has had a, a lot longer opportunity to chew on this $372,000 that's going to come to him. Uh, the schools are just seeing it for the first time this evening, and I certainly want to have most of the morning set for them to discuss this and vet through it. But uh, you know, I don't know, because come back here again and having the same discussion over the same idea, I'm not sure it's going to give us any more. It's going to be any beneficial, but we certainly would do that. We can, we can absolutely do that. Well, it may provide you with another opportunity to further close the gap. But like I said, we'll do it. Absolutely. Let's have our meeting tomorrow. When we're here on the 23rd, but we'll, uh, but that's, you know, the 23rd is quite a ways away. And so that window is getting like that at this point. So you know, if you guys want to come up with more money and you have an idea other than the, um, you know, the borrowing, I mean, yes. Uh, through you to Mr. Bernard, who's hopefully behind me somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Probably, you'll probably want to hit me with a stab, <laughs> you know, stab me or something, yeah. Uh, what's the, what is the uh, drop dead date for giving teachers contracts for next year? Uh, we have time. Okay, thank you. Tell me. Uh, if the schools want to make any comment, or you'd rather hold your discussion for tomorrow, it's up to you. Can we get a check tomorrow morning for that 721? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'll bring it with me. Oh, thanks, Phil. Mill Webster, uh, school committee chair. I'll make this brief because tip-off is at 920. Go Cats. Um, very uh, pleased with the effort put in by all the members from the Finance uh, Committee, Selectman, Town Administrator, to look for more funds for both sides of the budget. Our gap for our recommended budget is over $1.2 million. Obviously, 721000 doesn't cover it, but it gets us a lot closer. We have our um, budget workshop on Wednesday. We have our public hearing for our budget on Monday night, the 9th. So between now 
and the ninth will determine what we will present on the ninth. That won't be our final budget, obviously, because the final budget will be what the final budget is. But at, the, at this time, I'm happy that we've gotten this far and uh, hopefully we can find some more. I know this is one of the tougher years that we've seen. A lot of times um, the finance director, the selectmen, <coughs> administrator, schools, we're, we're, we're able to come up with a few additional funds here and there. Those accounts are pretty much uh, dry as a bone right now. We've taken all the revolving accounts, both on the school side and the town side. <coughs> so there's just not a lot there. So uh, like others, I'm hesitant using one-time funds and I don't think that the money from the Pulte Homes is gonna cover everything in the future, but it certainly is, is going to help. So just from my, my point of view, uh, I'm happy to see the effort and look forward to uh, working starting tomorrow at Finance Planning. Thank you. Thank you. Go Cats. All right, if there's no other discussion on this, uh, we'll cer certainly circle back on the 23rd uh, at this meeting. And, um, we're going to open this up now to for public comment. Anyone here for public comment? Mr. Schultz. I just something I would like to bring up. We do old and new business at sometimes at like eleven o'clock at night, and I'm thinking we should be doing this in the public comment time frame of our meetings only because that's when those people are watching this on television. I think that's where a lot of our new ideas and new uh, business gets spoken. Then I think they have it at the end of our. We is kind of counterproductive. I just wanted to throw that out there to see what the board felt about that. Well, typically we do public comment in the beginning, but because we had the scheduled right. sessions. Um, but I, I think I understand what you're saying. Is you, when we have the um, opening of the meeting, we have public comment, and then we do all the new business right out of the gate because people aren't falling asleep by then. And yeah. They Sometimes it's 11:20. We're doing old and new business, and there's like five people watching. And Mr. Masseri, Mr. O'Leary, you've been here a lot longer than us. Is there a reason why you, we do old and new business at the end? I mean, you guys have been doing it since I've been because on Because most people aren't paying attention to that time of day, and we can embarrass <laughs> ourselves terribly, so hopefully the fewer people that are here see us, uh, the better. Uh, no particular reason. No, okay. <laughs> yes. I'm sure it's because nobody wants to, it's for our personal <clears throat> privilege, essentially. No one wants to listen to us pontificating anyway, so that's why it's at the end of the meeting, right? You know, public service announcements and pontificating, so. Mr. Messier. I think old and new business a lot. Uh, we've kind of turned it into a discussion of various things. And why it's at the end for my, uh, the way I look at it is you get through a meeting, right? And as a result, you may have some ideas of going forward with something new. And we don't particularly do that. I, I think at our last meeting, I mentioned something. It was really new business. Otherwise, we're talking about what happened at the park and mm -hmm. we're congratulating somebody and so on and so forth. Yeah. yeah. So would you have an objection to trying it out one or two times and doing it in the beginning after public comment? Well, I think that, uh, I think there's two pieces of it. We're yeah. talking about congratulating people and some of those things. Yeah. I have no problem doing it at the beginning. Okay. But I think if we're, if we're getting to the end of a meeting, we want to, Maybe talk about something that we want on our agenda yeah. for the next meeting, and yeah. you do that at the end. Yeah. No, certainly we, you know, Mr. O'Leary has a um, really good pulse on the community and some of the folks that have lived here their whole entire lives, and you know, we hear about the passing of some of these people. We only really, you know, sometimes we only catch it in the transcript, but it does seem weird to me late at night, and you bring up these very important people in town, and we're only hearing about them at 11, you know 10 o'clock at night. And I think it's worthy of consideration. So, just want to throw it out there. We'll table it for now. And we'll <laughs> okay. Um, that's going to bring us nobody here for public comment. So we're going to go change your manager in Speedway. <laughs> and the members are here, uh, Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. So uh, I believe Attorney Upton is here on behalf of Speedway, and I believe that the proposed manager is also here as well. Just by way of background uh, information for those who may or may not know, um, there was a dedicated manager of record for Speedway. I believe that that individual was um, uh, not working for the company for some period of time due to personal reasons. Uh, license was renewed uh, at the end of December last year for calendar year 2018. 
um, with an acting manager standing in capacity and the, my understanding of the transaction this evening that's being requested, the approval that's being requested would be to dedicate a new permanent manager of record for Speedway. And that board may remember that we sent a letter to Speedway in late January asking for them to uh, finalize uh, such an action which they're attempting to do this evening. Okay, oh, please introduce yourself if you wouldn't mind. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Andrew Upton representing Speedway. With me is Nick Tarallo, the proposed uh, permanent manager of record. Uh, Nick was in for a couple of months, sort of training for this position in October and November. Uh, apparently, it went well because uh, now he's been selected as the permanent manager. Uh, he has a great deal of retail experience. Uh, he is uh, someone the company wanted to bring in uh, to sort of stabilize the position here in this this uh, this store, and he has recently completed tips training, so he has both experience with the sale and service and supervision of people with alcohol. Uh, and now that he's become he's proposed to become the official manager, he's taken the tips training, so he's up to speed on that as well. Uh, with that, we're glad to answer any questions. Mr. Schultz. Uh, what type of uh, technology does Speedway have as far as, do you have anything swipe licenses or what's the, what do you guys do there? Yes, our, our policy is to ID anybody that appears 40 years of age or younger and we, we scan the license into the POS system every, every time. Do all 50 states show up on it? Yes, all 50 states are, well, it will check if the license is expired. It will also compare the date of birth against the um, legal sale age. And would you accept out-of-state licenses as well? Out-of-state licenses, yes. Um, we do accept those, but if we're not comfortable with it, we will ask for a second form of ID, of course. Mrs. Minupelli. Just a couple of questions. Um, your attorney Upton said that you have experience in retail sales of, is it alcohol? Do you, what could you describe to the board what your retail sales experience is? Um, I've been with Speedway about three years. I've moved from the Lemonster Speedway, so we didn't have alcohol in that store. Um, but I've moved uh, to a couple of different stores. So my first experience with alcohol was actually North Reading Speedway. So you're already working there? You've already been working there? Right. Yeah, he, he had a test in October and November uh, where the district managers and the regional managers sort of evaluated his ability, capacity to do this in a store that had alcohol. So he was there for sort of a two-month test period before he was chosen for the permanent job. So are you, are you planning to relocate from Lemonster to the North Reading area? Um, I plan on continuing to commute for a while. So what would your hours <coughs> be as the manager for this location? Uh, currently, I work 5 a.m. to 3 p.m. daily, give or take. Sometimes I stay a little bit late. So then the, the individuals selling the liquor after you leave are, are they over 18? Are they 21? Are they... Um, yes, we, all of our employees are over eight, at, at least 18 years of age or older. Um, I don't believe I have anyone that's younger than 21, and I do have a lead assistant manager who's also uh, TIP certified, and okay. I'm always on call, and I answer my phone in the first ring for him any, any time of the day as well. Okay. So you mean that individual is on from 3 o'clock in the afternoon? Uh, the correct. other TIP certified individual? Correct. Currently he is doing 1 p.m. to 11 p.m. So we have a little overlap. I'm there until 3 p.m. He comes in at 1 p.m. What, what do you do on weekends? How does the other shifts work? Currently on the weekend, I have uh, what we call a lead CSR, also TIP certified. Um, he'll work in the morning until about 2 p.m. or so. And then I have that lead assistant manager also on the weekend working the night shift as well. We, we, we always have at least one member of management that's TIP certified. I wouldn't say 100% of the time, but almost 100% of the time. And any of the cashiers that are selling alcohol are TIP certified, and they are checking IDs.
Any other questions? Nope. Okay. Mr. Schultz. Mr. Chair <coughs> excuse me, Mr. Chairman, I move to approve a change of manager for the packet store wine and bulk malt beverage license for Speedway from Donna Gilberti to Nicholas Tarallo. Second. If a motion is second, any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Yeah, sorry. Well, to council is that uh, you know if there is going to be a change in manager, uh, make sure the town is notified sooner rather than later. Both for better relationships when we doesn't find out about it through the through the grapevine or. I understand and I agree. I I, I believe part of the problem was that Donna had some uh, <coughs> some type of chronic illness or long-term illness and we thought that she would be coming back okay. but unfortunately she never was able to so we brought in Nick for a temporary period he turned out good and they determined to make the switch but I, I understand what you're saying okay. perfect I so did have Nick, one other question there. I'll be here for a while so I did have a quick question for you though I meant to ask you early do you guys scan use a scanner on the IDs yeah, what we do is we scan the back of the ID. There's a code on it, and we scan that code, and that will it will tell us yeah. either okay or nay. Thank you. It's a good system. Yeah. Okay. We still check. Any it, other um, motions for that? What's it? No, it's just one. Thank you. Have a good evening, and thank, thank you for so being much. patient. Thank you very much. Okay. Minutes. Minutes, please. We got quite a few. Yep. Thanks. All right. Starting off, uh, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I gotta be, gotta be clear. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the February 26, 2018 regular session minutes as written. Got a motion to it. Second. second by Mrs. Minipelli. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Executive session. All right, Mr. 26. Chairman, I move to approve the February 26, 2018 executive session minutes as written. Second. A second by Mr. O'Leary. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. February 28th, joint meeting with Andover. Minutes. Are these the ones done by the amazing Gilberto? <laughs> yes, I hope oh, that's in there. I want to make sure. I didn't read it. I'm going to hand, I'm going to yeah. actually make that amendment. Yeah. Mr. <laughs> Chairman, I move to approve the February 28th, 2018 regular session minutes as written. That's a joint meeting with the town of Andover. Second. Second by Mr. Masseri. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. March 5th, 2018, regular session. Mr. Chairman, I move oh, to approve. Did I miss one? No. Uh, March 3rd, uh, budget session. Yeah. I did. Okay. I did miss one. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the March 3, 2018, budget session minutes as written. So I have a second by Mrs. Minupelli. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Mr. M Mr. O'Leary? Aye. Thank you. <laughs> March 5th. I'm sorry. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the March 5th, 2018 regular session minutes as written. Second. I have a motion, a second by Mr. Masseri. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. March 14th, joint meeting with CPC. No, it was, it's crossed off. Oh. It's crossed off? Yeah, it, it, on the, um, sorry, updated tonight. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you, Mike. No, but it, when we posted it, it was my mistake when I did the agenda. I put it on, and it wasn't supposed to be there. But if you notice, we, we inked out the ones that are at the door. My apologies. Okay. March 14, 2018, joint meeting with CPC and EDC. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the March 14, 2018 joint meeting with CPC and EDC minutes as written. Second. Second by Mr. O'Leary. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Unanimous. March 19, 2018 regular session. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the March 19, 2018 regular session minutes as written. Second. Second by Mr. O'Leary. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. March 19, 2018, executive session. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the March 19, 2018, executive session minutes as written. Second. Second by Mr. O'Leary. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. And that's that. Legal bills, February. 
One second, Mr. Chair. You're on the clock. All right, legal bills. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve legal bills for February 2018 in the amount of $4,809.02 as follows. Coltman and Page, PC General, $4,163.02. Coltman and Page, PC Labor, $646 for a grand total of $4,809.02. Second. I have a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Okay. Arthur Kenny Field Restrooms Concession Project. An update and then a little vote, maybe. Does that sound good? Mr. O'Leary or Mr. Gilberto? <laughs> Mr. Mr. The amazing the Gilberto. He has the latest up-to-date information. Um, the amazing <laughs> Gilberto, over to you. <laughs> <laughs> You're never going to live that down. There was a meeting. There was you a meeting this morning, but <laughs> there was a meeting this morning, but other issues have come up and apparently been resolved. Uh, Mr. Chairman, through you, through you, a couple of things to report. Um, as I indicated in the meeting notes, there was a meeting of the Athletic Facilities Committee uh, early this morning to review a potential change order. Uh, in the amount of approximately $11,000, which would have allowed for uh, paving uh, an access driveway adjacent to the brick walkway um, that accesses, uh, that connects the sidewalk and parking lot on the east side of the field complex, which is up here on the, uh, <coughs> on the board. Um, <coughs> The thinking being that right now when we access by vehicle for purposes of loading or maintaining the facility uh, at the um, Arthur Kenny Field, uh, vehicles drive alongside the walkway uh, but not generally on the walkway so as to avoid damaging it. And the area in question, if you look on this map, and this is an image that indicates, uh, reflects when the, building, the team room itself was under construction right here. So that's the existing team room. That is the former Arthur, uh, that, that's the former concession stand, uh, the new concession stand slash restroom facility is being built in its place right there. The brick walkway is right here running north to south with the memorial area with benches. The paved area would be just the side of it here, uh, running from the parking lot up here down to the concession stand. And again, it would be mostly for maintenance access um, in and around the facility. And the thinking was there's already paving included as part of the scope of work for the a modular building project in and around the actual restrooms and concession stand, um, but there may be an opportunity to do all the paving at once. Uh, the challenge is that right now the uh, appropriation uh, for the project, uh, the budget, I should say, the budget for the project has only a construction contingency remaining of about $5,000. So this cost would exceed our available funds. Uh, fortunately, the friends of North Reading Parks and Recreation have stepped forward and committed to uh, address not only uh, the difference of about $6,000 to um, allow this to be affordable, but in the event that there were any other uh, issues that were to come up in the interim period or after, um, they would be also willing to cover the uh, amount that the town would be fronting, the $5,000 as well. So they're willing to take on the entirety of the cost to pave this and basically complete the uh, site work on this facility at this time rather than at a later time uh, if need be, uh, but at a minimum would be willing to take on the $6,000 differential. <coughs> So based on that uh, information, um, the Athletic Facilities Committee had a discussion uh, relative to its um, position on that. And before I go into the second piece of the update, I'll ask Mr. O'Leary to speak to the discussion at the committee meeting and the outcome. Uh, there were some members of the committee, uh, myself included, that we were obviously concerned with uh, overspending the budget. Um, but again, the uh, Friends of the uh, Parks and Recreation, uh, again, the revenue that they have available is through the sale of banners on the field and the use of those funds had to be specific to the complex and uh, whether it be maintenance or capital improvements so this would certainly fall within the uh, purview of the uh, monies that are available uh, they made it quite clear that they would be willing to cover the entire cost up to the eleven thousand dollars and some change if necessary uh, of course the, uh, the committee you know also felt that you know if the five thousand dollars were available we would do that within the appropriation they would make up the difference and have more funds available for other projects uh, maintenance uh, later on so that was a magnanimous gesture on their part to uh, get from a timing standpoint to get it done on a timely basis as the aprons are going to be be done it also would allow for a seamless uh, roadway get the roadways for uh, 
maintenance and deliveries as well as uh, public safety access and vehicles that be abolished at the top of the parking lot so regular vehicle traffic wouldn't be able to, uh, to access it and uh, you know, so from a, a timing standpoint it seems to be the right time to do it uh, from a financing standpoint obviously the committee's concerned about uh, spending more than we have appropriated so that's that's not easily done and uh, since they're willing to cover the entire cost if possible the board uh, the committee voted unanimously to recommend to the board and approve the change order throw an idea on I ran into a little of the same problem on a project because I, I think paving is gonna look awful but are you guys familiar with uh, roller grass pavers so you, you basically roll it out it's got little holes in it throw some loom in it throw some seed in it and you can drive over it all day long you can cut grass as it grows up through it but it's very rugged and it blends right in with the grass you can drive dump trucks over it cement trucks over it none of it's gonna ever move significantly inexpensive and it will look wonderful going up against that path but you put a big paved I asphalt I think it's eight foot right you can roll these out they come in four foot sections you can get up you know for 365 bucks you can get 24 feet or you know it's cheap it'll take nothing to put it down it's something to consider but if you're, you're all sold in bought in on this idea but the other way it lets water go through it it looks green it looks wonderful from the road it doesn't take away from that beautiful pathway that they put all that money in something that you, you you're familiar with them steve you've seen them right know what you, mean, yeah. you drive over them because yeah. i had a lot of utility poles that i was had to give access to and it was middle right through people's yards and i learned a hard lesson so but this turned out to be great and they could drive right i plow them too mm -hmm. plow right over and um, not that we'll be plowing that i don't believe but you can do it it's very rugged mm -hmm. something to look into okay, okay? so they're called um grass papers roll roll grass papers yes I did have a question about that just the placement is that into the baseball field where that's gonna be no no, no. it's behind the dugout which is right here yeah oh, the field. this okay. is yeah. the uh, all right. right here I believe. the batting cage is a little further up right uh, up right here. yeah yeah oh, so okay. it's not even yeah, all it's right. not near it okay. it's just consider it, it it looks really nice when it all grows in It'll save you about eight grand. How does it stay in the ground, though? So once you put it into the ground, you so you dig up the ground about that much. You lay it down, then you put the loom inside it. You pack it all down, and you throw the grass seed on it, and it just grows right through it. And once that grass roots get underneath it, it holds it it's like a cheetah pad. So <laughs> um, I can show you an example. So. That's what I did. I, I installed it myself. It rolls in. You fill it in, and it looks fantastic when it's done. Yeah, very, very easy. Okay, but just an idea, but yeah, that, that I, is an I, idea. But I think what what's anticipated is that you know it's going to be executed within the next forty-eight to seventy-two hours. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it may, the train may have left the gate on this one, so. But I just wanted to throw it out there. Why is that hard to acquire? Well, uh, it's they probably have done the infrastructure work already. Is you know to do asphalt, there's probably a lot more work to it than this, so they probably already did it. Uh, I don't believe they've done any prep work at the site yet because they're waiting this awaiting this authorization. But the timeline to obtain and identify a contractor to install it may may be a challenge because they're looking to conclude construction this Wednesday. Oh, that's what our understanding right. is. Yes. So this is just a picture of what it looks like um, when it's all said and done. Mm. And you drive right over it, plow it, do whatever you want. Yeah. That's nice. That's nice. Personally, I kind of like that. Yeah. It'll look. It'll make that walkway look a lot nicer than having a big black asphalt next to it. Super. Right. It's perfect. This is a perfect solution for that. We can certainly inquire to see what the timeline would be. You can do it with brick pavers, or you can do the stuff that I bought, which is cheap. It just rolls out. More grass grows through it than mm -hmm. the, you know, the pavers. The pavers are a little hardier, too. Quick to put in. It won't All right. disintegrate either. It'll no. be there for centuries. No, and this, that, that PVC stuff won't either, though. Right. It's That's rugged. Major, yeah. You're right. It, and it actually, you know what's nice? It does fluctuate if you have a lot of frost ease or whatever. 
you'll never even see it because mm. it's built right in with the ground. It moves. Mm. How wide are those things? These, this one uh, is four feet wide. All right, so it'd be too wide. And I forget, you can buy them in bigger rolls and you roll it right out. That's nice. The prep work is significantly less than preparing for asphalt because you got to put a multi layer of rocks and then you put in your binder and then you got to pay it. Anything else? Do we have to vote? Uh, there, there is more. There is more. Okay. Um, so <laughs> we, uh, over the past few business days, the contractor construction dynamics has been working to uh, tie in the wastewater pipe uh, to carry um, wastewater from the combined concession restroom building to the existing uh, wastewater line that comes out of the team rooms here on the northeast side of the property and goes up to the north northeast to where the treatment plant is at the back of that parking lot. Um, and it's been a, a bit of a challenge to locate the um, pipe, um, uh, which uh, I, we believe they did today, if that's correct. Um, uh, so there was some discussion about whether or not the location of the pipe being different than where uh, we all thought it was when we were working off of the design plans in the spring of last year as built plans not being finalized until I think September we said John is that right of, uh, of this year um, there was some discussion about whether or not that was going to generate a change order um, late this afternoon but uh, the architect reported to the superintendent of schools and I at about 615 this evening that she had spoken with construction dynamics and that they would be completing the job um, uh, at least with regard to this issue without submitting for a change order again um, anything can happen um, we thought this was the last minute, but there's two more days worth of last minute as well, so we'll be monitoring that. Um, but um, that's where we stand as of today. I, Mr. It, it begs the question, where did you think it was and where did it end up being? <laughs> so, I, I, have, I have to ask that. So um, the town's land surveyor, it's Superintendent Bernard, is out here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll just oh, note close. that we, we um, <laughs> We kind of we were under the impression from the design that it was gonna was more of an angled connection. John, is that right? Yes. Uh, and it turns out that the construction is more of a kind of a straight out 90 degree connection, and the existence of that elbow, according to the engineering firm that worked for the building designer, indicated that there needed to be a certain amount of clearance from that elbow to cut in a new connection. And so when you start talking about clearing that, there's a fence. John, you have to correct me if I'm wrong. There's a fence right here, I believe. Yes, right, right about there. So we need to go kind of through the site, the, the, the finished site work here, underneath that fence and connect at a further point in time north, if I understand that correctly. So that, that's what the challenge was, honestly. Um, but isn't there a pump, an ejector pump right near there? Th there is, and on the site, I don't know exactly where it is. The superintendent may know where it's located. It's, it's, it's actually, I think they had to extend 15 feet to not be on top of that ejector pump. It's, in, it's right above where Michael is now with the laser. Wouldn't it just be easier to go right to that? Job. So uh, I, I, it could be. I, I can't profess to know whether it is or is not early, easier. I shouldn't but have asked the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just, I got you. Never mind. Move on. Pretend I never <laughs> asked. Okay. So we have proposed a change order approval uh, in here, and uh, the language. Um, that's in there, I think, reflects the scenario I just described. And if it does not, uh, with the Mr. Schultz's indulgence, we can modify it on the on the on the on the fly. Yeah, I think you got it, uh, Mr. Chairman. I move to approve change order number five for paved access drive with any cost exceeding available funds we paid for by the Friends of North Reading Parks and Recreation Committee Inc. Second. I have a motion, a second. Any more discussion? I would just appreciate if you could just share my idea. And if it doesn't get legs, that's fine. It's good too. I think it's a good idea. I'm, I'm going to actually ask if the superintendent, having heard the conversation, might be willing to email the uh, the designer to see if she could follow up on I that. I think you're going to like it a lot more too. I'll do it. I'll do it it, it's, yeah. Thank you, superintendent. Environmentally, it's better. Everything. Mm -hmm. You think you're leaving tonight? <laughs> no, we're going right from here to the bar, from the bar to financial planning team. Oh, jeez. I'll send Thank you. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. It, by the way, looks pretty good, doesn't it? It looks yeah. great, Steve. I mean, yeah. the, the really good. As far as like it's been there. The brick facade on there. It matches the team room. Real good. It makes a huge, yeah. huge yeah. difference. So. Yeah, the roll gate in the front. It's nice. Yeah. yeah. It's great. 
Nice job. Okay. Uh, payment requisition? Um, no, although I have uh, received one that's still under review right now. Uh, so there will definitely be one for April 23rd. Okay. What's the ex estimated date of completion? So they've told us they expect to be finished on the site this Wednesday. That's what they've told us. The punch list may extend Except a week or two paving. after that. And no, they're planning to pave this week, which is why th this came up kind of urgently at the end of last week. Right um, the asphalt plant opened uh, today, and our understanding is that they are paving this week. Okay. Um, let's hold off on the next one because we have some visitors here, if uh, the board doesn't mind. I'm going to skip the next one. We're going to go right to the MWRA. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, MWRA and Andover water, wastewater discussion. Uh, and we'll come back to the rest. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I'll just note that for purposes of this evening's meeting packet, there are two documents that are in the Dropbox folder. One is in the packet itself, and it's actually a summary of some of the legal terms that have come up in discussion. And, and really what it is is the document I put in there, which I believe was distributed to the Andover Board of Selectmen at their last meeting to discuss this topic. Um, it just reflects the existing uh, force majeure and water uh, supply uh, or water drought issues in the existing intermunicipal agreement between the two communities. And then I've also included in that document the summary of terms language that dealt with the uh, issue of reductions in available water supply and the reductions being borne proportionally um, by the uh, two communities. And the reason is because I understand the question has come up in some of the public forums, and there have been many of them in Andover over the past few weeks, um, in terms of what happens if the Merrimack River runs out of water. And we've seen from our own engineering reports that that is uh, certainly highly unlikely based on the available watershed and the, the flow rate of the river. But it is a question that comes up, and it's a concern for the residents, I think, in Andover, both in terms of uh, what would, how, how would they fulfill their obligation? Would they still have to fulfill it? And uh, I think the answer is that there is existing language out there, uh, some of which may be carried forward into a mm -hmm. successor intermunicipal agreement. And we've also tried to encom encompass the fact that we, that North Reading, um, you know, for purposes of equity, felt that uh, reductions in available water being b borne proportionally amongst the communities was a, a fair way to address the concerns. Um, you know, and I, I've said this in some of the meetings along the way. I think North Reading would have had, would have preferred to have been um, the first priority for the available water supply coming out of Andover, but for obvious reasons, that's not going to to be the case. But this language we felt was a fair compromise uh, during the discussions dating back to last August mm -hmm. relative to the uh, reductions being borne proportionately. So that's what that document reflects and it really was intended just to identify that these are things that, that do get worked out during the discussions of any sort of negotiation. That was not represented to be any sort of a commitment between communities uh, but there, I think there's an understanding amongst all the parties that terms like these will be included. There'll need to be some updating of some of the terms. Um, there's a couple of terms that are in there that may predate some changes in the bylaws and Andover relative to water supply availability. That's something that would be hashed out during a, a later point in time. Um, the second thing that I'll just note is that in uh, the meeting packet, I put a copy of the public information form presentation that Andover has uh, used. Uh, town manager provided the updated version of it today to me. We had a previous version of it in the Dropbox folder last week under the, um, the folder that was created for this uh, topic. But this is the current version. Uh, of it. Uh, I didn't intend to review it this evening, but it is in the meeting packet there. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if you'd like me to review it, I'm certainly happy to try to do so or to go through the slides quickly. Th there's not Where many. is that listed? It's in the Dropbox folder for the meeting, and it's called North Reading Public Forums. Ah, okay. Thank you. All right. I, I can put it up there if you'd like. What page? Yeah. No, it's a separate folder. Oh, the Dropbox folder, the meeting folder. Yeah, you Mr. Masseri. Uh, having attended the, the morning uh, presentations to the Andover uh, citizens, uh, and as, as it progressed, the attendance got better, and the presentation was cleaned up and, uh, to answer the questions that were asked. And uh, I'd like to also uh, commend uh, All those on the Andover side that participated, 
and uh, <clears throat> Art Clark, who uh, I believe attended all of the meetings <laughs> uh, associated with the presentations. And, you know, I think it's had a real positive effect in terms of gathering how a lot of the Andover community is thinking about this and the questions and how best to present them. And that leads into, obviously, the Wednesday uh, town meeting. Great. Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, yeah, I've been, uh, again, I too have been uh, able to participate through the evening uh, presentations for the public's uh, uh, public information sessions. And again, to, to Bob's point, you know, I think the uh, presentation has gotten better and uh, also uh, quickly adapted to questions that were raised at some of these uh, public information sessions. I think uh, Andover has done a pretty good job of um, outlining, first of all, the, uh, the rationale for uh, the agreement that was already agreed to, the structure of the agreement that we had signed, and uh, they've done a pretty good job of getting that out there. The, the public seems to be far well informed now than they were you know, just a couple of months ago. And the questions uh, from the public, very thoughtful and, uh, again, legitimately concerned about certain things. Again, you know, primarily the 99-year deal, and I think having a representative from North Reading, again, we've been very careful not to uh, take a side or necessarily advocate you know, for or against um, the Andover residents to, to vote for or against this proposal. We're there for you know, just to answer, answer questions and explain you know, our rationale for proposing some of these uh, points that are, were in the uh, agreement, preliminary agreement that was signed by their board of selectmen and sent down, sent down to us. And I think that's gone a long way. I think when you, you put a face in front of them from, a, from, from the town of North Reading, uh, it's been very helpful and very informative. And I think people have uh, generally, generally walked away um, better informed, uh, satisfied with the answers and the rationale as to uh, why certain uh, points were within the agreement and why um, North Reading is seeking permanency. Uh, that's been a big bone of contention. And, you know, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's uh, it, it's gone a long way. And, and again, just to credit Mark, I mean, this guy here, he's, <laughs> he's been to every meeting and done a terrific job of uh, not only representing us when we weren't able to make it, uh, but also from a technical standpoint, explaining an awful lot of information uh, to the to the general populace up there. So it's uh, it's been very good. And I think it's important uh, for the board to uh, understand too that, you know, over the last three or four days, you know, there's been another question raised as to, you know, uh, what types of other uh, terms and conditions may be included in a final agreement. But one thing we've been uh, careful to, to state is two things. One is, um, you know, this vote at the town meeting is just another step in our ability to continue our discussions with the town of Andover. Obviously, a final agreement will have um, more details um, in relation to what our study finds as to how their system uh, can or cannot, you know, uh, provide us. Uh, again, preliminarily, it appears as though uh, they will be able to. You know, if there are any modifications that need to be made to their system, those would certainly be included in a final agreement. Uh, there was concerns raised as to whether or not, um, you know, there should be some sort of a minimum gallonage put into uh, the agreement that we would be required to by a certain minimum number of gallons. Uh, we as a board have not discussed that, uh, didn't have the opportunity to discuss it. And uh, I, for one, who was on the subcommittee and uh, talking with the members of the board, up to the subcommittee, members of the board up at Andover said, we were not going to have enough time to uh, deliberate that uh, before their, their town meeting on Wednesday night. Uh, but I think it's important for Andover to recognize, and we'll state it again uh, publicly, that, you know, we made a conscious decision several years ago to find a solution to our potable water uh, problems here, and we need a source that will uh, provide 100% of our water. And we now have, as of today anyway, uh, two options. We know we can go to the MWRA, and they will, uh, and are capable of uh, providing 100% of our water. Andover, it appears, you know, also has the capacity to do so, and depending upon how their town, their town meeting acts, um, uh, Wednesday night, if they take favorable action, that continues, that allows us to continue discussions with them 
for us to again purchase 100 percent of the water. It's not threatening its intention to purchase our water from another source other than our own. And it's not, uh, and it's not to be split. Uh, the ability to split, uh, the chairman made the point the other night at the end of our meeting is permitting wise, we wouldn't be allowed to do it anyway. Uh, so again, North Reading is committed to purchasing 100% of our water from another source in short order. And whatever decision we make by the end, again, we set a target date at the end of this month to make a decision as which way we're going to go, that's our intent. And it, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Chairman, but it hasn't changed. It's not changed. It has no not changed. No hidden agenda. We have nothing to hide. We've been so honest and open to this process. So, and I, and I did attend the other night, uh, and I think these have been extremely beneficial. I want to thank the folks from Andover attending this evening. Um, you know, what I heard was a lot of real smart residents. They get it, and you know, maybe the first time they didn't have the opportunity to vet it and understand it and ask the questions, but boy, they asked some great questions. I think they understand the value, and they understand, you know, why why this is necessary for them as well as it is for us. So. Again, we've made it clear too that you know, whatever choice they make, it, it's fine with us. Yeah. And, and this is an opportunity that was presented to us in our, in our board. I made a conscious decision to take advantage of that opportunity to work with Andover to see if they could get it through their town meeting uh, to have uh, the same piece of uh, special legislation, an article uh, reflecting the same piece of legislation that would be filed. You know, through their town meeting in order to effectuate a long-term deal uh, with their board. Mm -hmm. so, so it's up to them, you know, whether they want to sell us water or they don't. And that's really what, it's going to what it comes down to. And uh, we have certain uh, minimum requirements that need to be uh, met and maintained. Uh, and again, we explained to, to the people up there that there is no minimum requirement for us to purchase anything from, uh, from the MWRA. There is no minimum gallonage. You know, we will be permitted to purchase up to a certain amount from them, but whether we buy one gallon or none, if we pay the membership, we're in anyway. So uh, we're not looking for anything specific, as specific as what may have been proposed recently. But again, that can be talked about later on. You know. So I don't think you want to run through this presentation, right? I assume you don't want to. Well, do that one of the things that we wanted to be sure of is that you know, as we're sitting here, sitting in the audience Wednesday night, we, we Mr. Gilberto, myself, Mr. Masseri, just wanted to make sure that the other members of the board would not be surprised by anything that's being said, you know, uh, just again for transparency reasons. Mr. Schultz. Yeah, I'm not comfortable with us even being there on Wednesday night. I'm just one of five here. I think this is Andover's deal and they should <coughs> deal with that. I don't think we should be making any public statements. I don't even think we should be there, but if we're there, I think we should just be observing. I think this is for their town to do and for their voters to do. They've done an outreach to their town members, their citizens. I don't think we serve any purpose there. And I think it really, if for whatever reason doesn't go through and we make a presentation up there and that gets back to NWA or Reading, I think I think we have to be neutral here because I really do. And I'm, I'm concerned about us even making an appearance there. Mrs. Mignapelli? I, I, I agree with that. I won't be there anyway because of a scheduling conflict. Um, but I know I can watch it because I know they, you know, record it. But I also am concerned with the new information about the imposition of uh, specific amount that we're required to purchase. I guess that's a new contingency that's being talked about. I don't think they impose that on any water customer. You, you purchase what you use, and we shouldn't be treated any differently. We are a water customer. We should not be treated any differently than any other water customer. So I, again, I'm hesitant uh, um, this progress that's been made is amazing, but then again, these contingencies float in, stream in, and then we're back to square one of this just amazing frustration that that's even, that's even a thought. Why would we be required to purchase a certain amount, or the, why would that even be thrown about? I, I think it was made perfectly clear the other night, correct me if I'm wrong, Alex, that we were intending on discussing that we were not looking to discuss it necessarily and we weren't looking to change any of the parameters that were already uh, set up in the outline of the initial terms and conditions of the uh, intermunicipal agreement that we right. have as, as extended. Right, I um, get finalizing yeah, things yeah, and finalizing, finalizing right, it into a, a contract. And it was also conveyed that again, MWRA doesn't require it. We don't feel as though we should need to be required by, yeah. but you know, 
No. Where else would we get it from anyways? I mean, so no, that's the other, but, uh, the other <laughs> issue that I have is, in my recollection from going to the last Andover town meeting was their imposition upon RTA to stand up and basically explain herself. And I don't think that any member of this board or the TA should actually be required to get up there and do that. This, there's certainly a lot of effort that's been put in by you to, you know, meet the members of the public over there to explain, you know, why we're following down this process. But that's, that shouldn't be something that's imposed upon the board or the TA at their town meeting. Uh, that if, if people want to go and sit and watch, that's fine, but. I, I think what we found through these public uh, discussions and forums is that there is a, a greater uh, comfort level on the public's part up there, you know, hearing from us rather than from their own officials at this stage of the game. Again, there's some frustration as far as the need to have another special town meeting up there, uh, no doubt. Uh, but they have another need for it, and that has slowly trickled out as to the rationale as to why it's necessary. And I think people that have attended these forums understand that and have bought into the, the program um, as far as the need for it. I think it would be of assistance, and again, my concern and my willingness to go up and participate in these forums, again, was not to go up and sell the public up there as to which way they should vote, but to ensure that our position on the intermissible agreement that we have right now in place in the, in the framework that's been established, I wanted to make sure that our position is not, has not been, or could not be misrepresented, mm. right. you know, and that, you know, who can better do that than us? And, and I think, um, I think it is pro is probably important that someone be available to answer directed questions, not to debate the issues. And again, we made it very clear at the public forums too, we didn't allow our town meeting to negotiate the terms and conditions. And we don't anticipate to allow or accept the negotiations of terms and conditions to happen on their town meeting floor. They can ask, they can ask suggestions or suggest things to their board and all the rest, but to include it in the motion, as was done back at the end of January, is unacceptable from our, from our standpoint. We didn't do it down here. We laid it out, we laid out the framework, and we basically said, trust your board to do what's in the town's best interest, and they did unanimously here. Not necessarily the same case up there right now, um, but I think they feel the public would feel so much more comfortable, or some members of the public, if they get it right from us. Yeah. Uh, I get just as we're not, just to be sure though, that we have to be very careful, and again, we've been very careful with Sarah, Mr. Masera, myself, and, and Mark, you know, not to take a position on this and have stated publicly, listen, we're not here to sell this to you. We're here to help you become better informed to make an informed decision, and whatever you decide is fine, you know. and. I think that needs to be reiterated. And well, but if there are Mr. direct Macera, questions as to why it is not threatening want to do this. Before I, I recognize you, Mr. Messer, I just want to say that I don't disagree with your concerns, but I do believe that we have a responsibility on our part to represent the town, like Mr. O'Leary was saying, to make sure that there's some clarification and maybe some concerns and questions. Again, this is a 99-year opportunity we're talking about. And this would be the same way I would feel if we end up going with MWRA and we have to go to Reading's town meeting, I would expect us to be there. Because when the people are Reading, they're not gonna understand it either and they should hear from us because we're talking about a partnership. You know, and I tried to explain this the other night and I, and I wanted to, I've been trying to use this term a lot over the last several months, you know, the last several years. This just isn't in a contract, this is a partnership. And I think we have to make sure we advocate that every town meeting that has anything to do with this water, whether it's in Reading or it's in Andover. So I, I think it is important. I think we have a responsibility as board members to do that. And because we've been we've been tasked by our town meeting to do this. But I agree with you. We shouldn't go there and be a sales job or be advocating on behalf of the board. I think they know what they're doing. They've done a much better job this go around. And I don't, we shouldn't go there and make a presentation, but we certainly should be prepared to make sure that it's clear on our position and the path that we're taking, because uh, you know, this is a long, long time, 99 years. But Mr. Messier. In these uh, meetings, right, people ask questions. It wasn't the bargaining you know, the team on either side that brought up the minimum gallons. It was a citizen that said, why isn't that in there? If the citizen 
totally understand, understood you could go hand over and go to MWRA, and that's what our water source is going to be, then it wouldn't have been as big a concern. It may not have even been raised. So the, the purpose of the meeting has been very valuable to the limited group that attended the meetings, and I think that leads into you know, the uh, questions that might come up that we could better answer at the town meeting. But let's ask that question. We have the tech technical folks here. Mark, if you wouldn't mind coming to the podium, I'd like to ask you a question, and I want it on the record. Okay? Make sure I understood it correctly. When we decide on a path, whatever that path is going to be, we're going to have to take some action and contact DEP and say, this is the path we're taking, correct? Correct. And then they're going to approve that particular path. And then once we do it, it's not like we can pick up the phone a year later or six months later and say, we want to add another path, right? No, no. So there are a couple paths we're going to have to go down in terms of those state regulators with this. We've talked about the uh, Interbasin Transfer Act approval. Right. Whether we go to MWRA, that will be a whole new approval, or whether we expand the current one we have with Andover, that's one path. They're not looking to... and. This is something, I mean, it's a little strange. They don't want to hear this, that our existing interconnection with Andover can supply more than a million and a half gallons a day because they wrote it into the regulations that it would be one and a half million gallons a day, and supposedly the hydraulic capacity of that interconnection is one and a half million gallons a day. They don't even want to, they don't even want to hear that you have excess capacity, that the pipes are bigger than they need to be right now. So to approve uh, an Merrimack River connection and also approve a, a, a Quabbin Reservoir or an MWRA connection would not happen. Um, the other thing is, from a DEP permitting standpoint, uh, there would it would be problematic, I believe, from that yeah. standpoint as well. So and that doesn't even raise the, the whole cost issue of, of going to the MWRA. Right. You know, there are huge mm -hmm. permitting factors going that way. Uh, there's huge engineering costs we'd incur going that way. There's the MWRA buy-in of seven plus million dollars. There's the other infrastructure improvements of 11 million dollars. So, if we have a, a, a source that gives us 100 percent of our capacity and we can't permit another source and it would cost us 18 million dollars plus on top of that to go another way, I mean that, that's that kind of answers the question: Are we looking to go to to split this and go two ways? We're not. Thank you. I just wanted it on the record. I just confirmed what I thought. So at this point, if there's anything in the presentation that's up on the screen that any of the board members that haven't seen it would like us to run through them, we are more than happy to do it. Andover is here as well to answer any questions. You need a few minutes to... Yeah. No, we I, I think we made our position very clear. Yeah. No, no, but is there anything in that presentation that's up on the screen that you are no, concerned I, I with? No, I looked at it. And I, I'll just reiterate, I understand that a citizen brought that up, but I've said it before, citizens rule. Town meeting, citizens rule. That's who rules. And that's what happened the last time. And the terms and conditions that we understood, citizen changed. So it's, it wouldn't be a shocker, and it shouldn't be a shocker for those who are planning to attend that that, that happens, it, because it's already, it's already been proposed in these water workshop so I, I think I think uh, get my observation and maybe it's a little bit off base and, and I hope you don't take offense but is that I think while it was brought up in one of the forums I think the reaction from some members uh, of the administration and the board up there they were very quick to try and incorporate and remove the argument without thinking through the process as to what would our reaction be and our reaction was not very favorable towards it and nor was I willing to come forward and bring it to this board for consideration for a long period of discussion, you know, before their town meeting. Uh, that didn't sit well with, with some members up there, and that's okay. Can, you know, uh, town meeting can do what they want to do, and it's as they did up there. Um, and again, we spoke to a number of people in these forums who supported the amendment. And as I said, it was a good, legitimate question and amendment to be made yeah. in that forum. Yeah. And based upon the information you had, it wasn't a bad vote. However, what you weren't informed about was that that was a deal breaker. You know, Perfect. that was a deal breaker for us. It was a legitimate us. amendment. Right, it was a legitimate amendment based upon the information they had. And when yes. we explained our position to, to these people now, they go, aha, uh -huh, we get it. Right. 
Okay. You know. I think that that's what we were tasked yeah. at our town meeting to do. I do. I really believe yeah. that. So, that's what you know, I, I think, you know, this whole thing on the minimum gallage, which could very well be an amendment uh, Wednesday night, it's incumbent upon, you know, this administration up in Andover to say, North Reading, first of all, hasn't had a chance to really, you know, discuss it and cover it at this particular point in time before town meeting. Secondly, MWRA does not require a minimum amount of gallons to be purchased. So there may be a reluctance on their part, and it isn't necessarily appropriate to be negotiating these terms and conditions in this forum. But you can be sure we'll bring it up later. <laughs> you know, but, and hopefully town meeting will acquiesce and give them the authority to negotiate the final deal with us, as our town meeting has provided us. Mr. Schultz. Just to follow up on Selectman O'Leary said, to me, a minimum gallons would be a deal breaker. Right, that's, to me, great, we're done. Yeah, it makes so sense. I, it Logically, doesn't make sense. Yeah, it makes no sense. So I mean, I, I just want to make sure that's clear to to your residents. I, and thank you again for everything you've done with your outreach and everything. But it's to me that's it's, well, we're done at that point. I just my yeah. initial reaction was first of all, it's not necessary. Secondly, it's it's not uh, going to be required of us by the other party that's looking to to get our business in. Uh, where else are we going to go? Right. We're in well, we hundred percent one way or the other. And to me, it's an up and down vote on what we've already. Uh, we, I think we've been, as a board, we've been very good about outlining what North Reading's position is. To me, it's just it's an up and down vote from Andover, yes or no, with no changes. That's kind of just how I view it. Now. Well, if the folks at Andover are listening this evening, and I, I'm just going to say it, you know, this board has been open about our intentions and what we're trying to achieve. We have no hidden agenda, and if we continue to be treated in with amendments on town meeting floor on this particular subject then to me that's a strong message that we're never going to gain the trust of the residents in Andover and that we'll never have a true partnership and that it's probably a clear direction for us on what direction we need to go in. That's how I feel. I'm not going to speak for anyone else, but I can tell you I that's I think you speak opinion. for all of us. And, um, you know, we, we need to move on and hopefully they do the right thing on Wednesday evening. I think Mr. Ms. Fold has hand up. Yes. Uh, you, would you come to the podium and just sure. announce who you are? And sure. Alex Smith-Bowley, one of the members of Board of Selectmen. I do want to thank uh, Mark uh, for attending everyone. I've attended all of them and three of the board members here who have attended them. And they've been, it's been phenomenal to have the other voice in the room, I think that, uh, and Michael. Um, and I do think there's value in having you at the town meeting on Wednesday night for questions. Because the questions that have come up have been clarifying questions. And they've had a tremendous amount of credibility <coughs> to what we're saying in this presentation. So I think it has tremendous value and um, different things come up and I just want to thank the time because the last thing you guys need is more meetings on your agenda uh, to come to, to, to Andover. Um, the, the, just a clarification, we had a resident that saw the minimum gallons on the uh, extension of the IMA that didn't get lifted over. So that's where that came, that came out. It was a logical question. Why was it here and why was it not in the permanent one? So I think it was a fair question. I think uh, uh, Selectman Prisco and Selectman O'Leary, I think at our meeting, the last Thursday, Thursday. night, um, addressed that. And I think the question that'll come up, that has come up, and it's just a, um, and I don't think it's outside the terms, it's just not stated explicitly that if we get the affirmative vote on uh, Wednesday and you make your decision subsequently to go with the end over that, you're making a hundred. You're, you're going to get your. You're going to get your water from Andover for the length of the 100 percent for the length of the, the agreement, and I think that. And I think you're saying you said that in so many words, and I think that's that was the question that had come up. So it wasn't really a, a change. The, the reason um, that it was brought up was because it was in the IMA, the five-year IMA, and we had a resident. In fact, the resident that actually made the amendment, who's not going to make that amendment anymore. Uh, <laughs> Who's, who was at the meeting tonight, and you know, he's been very participative over the last week and really trying to get in and, and understand uh, the agreement. But he, you know, that was the other piece that's brought up, is that you know, we, we're in, there's no out for, we know it, we're now out, we're in 100%. And if North Reading decides, if we decide, and then you decide to move forward with us, that it's 100% for the length of the agreement. And I don't think there's, that doesn't contemplate any minimum, but it's just a question that will probably come up. So, um, and again, that's not inconsistent what I think you've, you've said to us um, in the meetings. Just I don't have any reaction to that or not, but uh, that, that's, that's the thing that I see 
that has come up. It came up again tonight in a positive way. You know, I think uh, more people that uh, come to these meetings, and and I think Mark's great technical review of the situation in your basin and your current water system has been of tremendous help, and it hasn't been advocating one way or the other, but it's certainly questions that we wouldn't have been able to answer. And it adds a ton of credibility to uh, to the overall partnership. And it is a partnership. We view it as a partnership. We're, we're talking about an extension of a 45-year partnership. So that's we have a little more clarif clarification around this, this permanency piece on the other side. Mrs. Minipelli. Thank you. And I do recall that being put in there as a term, but that was because Andover was shoring up its revenues knowing it was going to be losing right, no, North Reading as a water customer. Yeah, that was explained. So that was almost penalizing for the departure at the end of sure. the term. Yeah. So I, I remember that yep. crystal clearly in terms of this yep. partnership going yep. back and forth. Yep. So I, I know why that was put in there, yep. and certainly I agree with Selectman Schultz, if it's amended and that is incorporated, it's a deal breaker for me as well. Yeah, and it was explained, it actually did a great job tonight explaining that, why that was in there and kind of the evolution of that five-year IMA with the understanding there'd be a hole in our revenue and how do we plan for that <coughs> hole in the revenue. And I think the question really becomes, and I think you've answered it, I think it'll come up again and I think just a definitive statement that if you do decide to go with Andover, then it's going to be 100 percent of the water for the duration of the agreement is going to come from Andover and that doesn't I don't think that's a change any terms or anything but that's I think that's the permanency on the other end that would be asked <coughs> and I do I do think it's tremendous value in having a representative contingency at our town meeting on Wednesday night I'll leave that up to you but my own desire would be that I think it adds tremendous value and credibility Anything else on this subject? Well, thanks for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming this evening. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay. And let's see. Then we're going to go back to signing the ABCC seasonal renewal certificate. And I, before the consultants leave, actually. I got to go back. I do have to ask some questions. Yeah. Can we get you come up to the podium? I wanted to get an update on. Sorry, to go backwards, but I, I wanted to get an update on where we are in the progress of the technical data. Sure. Um, Rob Williamson from Wright Pierce. Um, I think I had reported before that I'll start with the easier one the, on the wastewater side. We had been making um, pretty significant progress there and um, should have fair. Um, amount of detail for you when that time comes when you ask us to come back. On the water side, uh, as you recall, we just got um, all the information we were looking for, I want to say a week and a half, two weeks ago, and we've been working practically around the clock to uh, do our best to make sense of that. Um, we're close. Um, we're I was telling Michael tonight we're struggling a little bit with um, their hydraulic model that they presented to us um, in how it functions and operates. Um, and I think between now and the 23rd, I think it is, when we'll be coming back, uh, it's going to give us an opportunity to re-engage the folks from Andover um, so that we can present, hey, this is what we're seeing, you know, do you feel in the same way. Uh, so, you know, we're making good, we're making good head, headway. I've gotten most of our the questions that we've had addressed. Um, I had a couple more um, comments come back from from the Andover contingent this afternoon. There's some questions that we had, so I, I think we're probably going to be in good shape to give you a, a fairly decent report in a couple of weeks. Yeah, because we're meeting on April 23rd. We're making a decision. Yep, I believe, right? <laughs> That's our next regular meeting, and we said by the end of, the, of yeah. April. There's a lot of time between now and then, and you know, I, I just need to know, get a heading check from you that, you know, is the risk level concerning what you've read? Are we, you feeling it's rough, roughly where you thought it would be? Um, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but yeah, no, you need to give me sort no, of Mike, an idea. Michael asked me that tonight. I don't see any deal breakers. Right now, I don't see any deal breakers. Okay. Any questions for? 
think we're good. Okay. I want you to go home and get a lot of sleep. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Take some Benadryl, get a good night's sleep, and uh, we'll see you here on the 23rd. Great. Thank you. No, thank you, honestly. Yeah. No. We, we know you're putting a lot of hours and time into this, and it's important that we get it, we get it right. Thank you both, and Mark especially. Thank you for going to all those meetings. It hasn't gone uh, without notice. All right, back to the sign, the ABCC seasonal renewal um, certification. Mark, you can hit the lights on the way out. Yeah, because I'm falling asleep. Mr. Chairman, I move to sign the ABCC 2018 seasonal renewal certification. Second. And a motion, a second by Mr. Masseri. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Ratify collective bargaining integrated agreement with DPW Local 25. Mr. Chairman, uh, we generally have gone through these documents in executive session. We did not do so this evening due to a time constraint. Uh, this is uh, effectively the integration of the most recently approved memorandum of understanding uh, into the existing uh, agreement. Uh, the effort was conducted by Bob Collins and by um, a representative of the Teamsters, and I believe the document that's been provided to us has been signed by the Teamsters. So we are recommending um, <coughs> that the board act to ratify the agreement. Um, if the board wishes to have further discussion of the agreement, we could certainly put it on the agenda for the April 23rd meeting. Uh, there is no, um, there's no change to any of the existing benefits uh, by virtue of this document. Uh, those changes were all affected uh, three months ago now. We're good. Any, anybody? No concerns? I'm good. Moving. Motion. Mr. Chairman, I move to ratify and sign the integrated collective bargaining agreement between the Town of North Reading and DPW Local 25 for the period of July 1, 2017 through June 30, 2020. Second. Second. I have a motion to second. Any discussion? I will just say that this is a great step. This is the momentum that we've, we've been waiting for for a long time. And so I uh, applaud you and, um, and the HR department to getting this done. And we have, a f I know, several more of these coming soon. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is a very important part of the step because when we go to renegotiate these without this being done, it, it gets very muddy, yeah. right, and very blurry. So thank you for your efforts. If there's no other questions, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Unanimous. Okay. Renew, I say review, draft, June town meeting warrant. Mr. Chairman, through you. Get you. Uh, I'm going to review the draft that's uh, in the um, in the meeting packet uh, this uh, this evening. Uh, we have some updated language that's come to us from discussion with bond con council, but uh, in the interest of time, I'll just review excerpts of the draft. Unless the desire is for me to read article by article. <laughs> so uh, moving right along to Article 24. <laughs> that was good. That was um, good. This is an article that was not in the last draft, and it would call for the establishment of a stabilization fund for the participating mm -hmm. funding agreement. And this would effectively be a place for us to set aside the savings associated with the uh, performance of the PFA that we saw this year and hope to see in future years where funding that we have appropriated toward health insurance benefits ends up not needing to be utilized to uh, account for um, costs incurred between the, the so-called deductible limits. Our auditors recommended that it would be a stabilization fund, and we believe this is the right place on the Warren article for it to be there. Um, it's a placeholder right now. We'll get language from the, uh, the auditor and from the finance director, which we'll have available on the 23rd. Moving right along, Article 25 is the uh, establishment of the 102-104 Lowell Road Regulatory Inspections Revolving Fund. You see in there that it's... Uh, for inspectional services. Um, they could be for the building department or from the fire department, uh, and they would be under the authority of the public safety director as we've proposed it here. The corresponding Article 26 is to set the uh, limits of the uh, amount um, on, in, the, uh, in the bylaws, um, which is something that's been forwarded to us by town council for the, for the revolving funds that were established at last year's town meeting. Um, so Article 27, 28. Cindy, just one other thing, and I don't have it right in front of me. You said it's going to be under the direction of the Public Safety Director? Correct, yes. Um, so going back on, the, on that, when we, when we discussed with, um, oh, forgive me, the building inspector relative to the last time we were in this situation, and that would be the development at 100 Lowell Road, 
the town, uh, it wasn't necessarily using um, permit fees. It was actually using fees that were paid by the state to the town for the development of 100 Lowell Road um, to uh, compensate the town for hosting the development. And those fees, as I understand it, were under the care, custody, and control of the Department of Public Works. Uh, it's not entirely clear to me why, but um, in this instance, we felt that where the uh, building department and the fire department both performing the majority, if not all, of the inspections, where they both fall under the public safety director, we felt this was the appropriate place for the account to be uh, managed. We, um, we can maybe anticipate <clears throat> some discussion about the funding for public safety director at a future meeting here and maybe even a town meeting. If that's the case, and again, I haven't got it in front of me, uh, which one is it, Article 1? Uh, it's 25. 25. Where does it say? Does it specifically mention public safety director in the article? It does, yes. It says program or purpose 102, 104 Lowell Road, regulatory inspections, department receipts uh, received in connection with the, the redevelopment of 102 and 104 Lowell Road, and then under the category representative or board authorized to spend, uh, it says public safety director. I think we need to expand it or and or, you know, town administrator, finance director, just in, that we don't want to. We don't necessarily want to, um, again, if the public safety director's position isn't funded at town meeting, what happens? You know, well, so under the charter, the, the responsibilities uh, default back to the town administrator, uh, but uh, that doesn't stop us from having a scenario where we identify the position and or its designee if that were more appropriate. Well, yeah, I just think we need to provide ourselves and again I don't want to put the moderator in a position of saying if there's an amendment on town meeting floor based upon a action on an earlier article uh, that it would be outside the four corners you know, that's uh, we, we have the flexibility again it could be as simple as it saying town administrator or designee and that would give wide latitude I think that would be more appropriate personally You know, and then in the end you can designate. Sorry, I had to uh, just step out for a second. I'm just suggesting that uh, rather than being specific to the public safety director position, being authorized, the only authorized representative to, to do it, Conversation with the town administrator, you know, maybe it'd be town administrator or his designee that he could designate whomever. Yes, Mr. Minnie. Do we have any other existing revolving funds, or what sure. have we done previously? Uh, we, we, we have a dozen of them, and they're generally under the care, custody, or control of the department. board or commission yeah. or department um, that's as associated with it. But to implement this new one, what, what would we typically do in a warrant? I don't know if the last article that we did it, the last did it for, uh, for the what? Port of Health. Port of Health. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but then we, but the one for the other project, uh, Lincoln Properties. I don't, I'm sorry? That, that wasn't a revolving fund. It was not. Through payments received from the state. But the authorization to spend the receipts from the state <coughs> were able to be spent. I don't remember exactly. I don't know that we put it under the building inspector. We didn't put it under the public works director. Okay. I'm not sure why, but. I don't know why either. But anyway. I mean, What's your concern? No, I, just in case the public safety director is, uh, isn't funded at a town meeting, if there's a discussion. And we have the article specifying public safety director. What happens then? I'm just saying put a town administrator as designee. We're. Um Article 25. And that way, the moderator isn't going to be put into a position to say that it's either within or without the, the four corners of the article. And then uh, the town administrator, who has the ultimate authority on all of this anyway, uh, can designate 
whoever he so chooses. Yes. So, in other words, if, if basically operating budget evolves into a specific discussion about funding a director of public safety or any other line items that are in there that that, that may want to be that's going to be before this article it'll be it's article. in the omnibus article yeah it's in the omnibus article if someone questions it then we should just amend the article and they took and take the money out for well i don't know that you'll be yeah, you're going to put the moderator in a position where he's going to have to say either it's in or it's out. This is very specific. If you put a town administrator as a designee, that covers it. Okay. That's a good suggestion. Well, again, I think the, I believe the goal you were trying to achieve is the funds are going to go into this location, mm -hmm. and then who's going to be responsible for the use of the funds to make sure the work's getting done with the funds? The supervisor of the department. The public safety director. That was the intention in the wording, right. because both departments fall under the public safety department, fire and building. Well, that is. I think you could put the town administrator. You could have multiple. In here, right? I think it would just say put town administrator or his there's a designee. That, that that covers it. Period. It covers all scenarios. You know. Yeah, that's fine with me. I don't. I, don't, I mean, do you have any problem with that? No. We, I mean, we certainly could do that. You know, it provides maximum flexibility, that's for sure. Absolutely. And I'm all for maximum flexibility. <laughs> we don't need a special town meeting to make a change. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What else? Um, Article 26, we've already reviewed. Uh, so articles 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, and 32 all relate to the so-called charter changes. And there was discussion at the last meeting about splitting these articles up into individual um, articles to take up basically the issue of the title change for the uh, Board of Selectmen, title change for town administrator, and uh, the change of the town meeting dates. And then there's corresponding action that impacts the town's bylaws and zoning bylaws as well. One thing to note, we do need to make a deter to determination on uh, how we want to present these articles because the Planning Commission will be required to hold zoning bylaw hearings in advance of the town meeting. So those, town, those bylaws that affect the zoning bylaw, and it does not appear that that's the case in the town administrator's position, but it is in the Board of Selectmen, who in limited cases, I believe, are the special permit granting authority. Um, it does impact it. So we've split them up kind of the, to the greatest extent possible, I think, in, in what we've done here. Um, in the splitting, we did that in-house. In We're going to ask town council to confirm our, our review, but basically it gives ample opportunity to address all of these things and for the public to um, express varying opinions on the different topics, if need be. Um, I w the first question I, I guess I would ask is, it, is it, it confirming the intent is to keep them split up in this fashion, because the last time we were asked to split them and we kind of went through and split them up to the maximum extent of it. And then the second question is uh, more so related to um, the board's position on these articles. And we've had some kind of informal discussion. Um, do, you know, we have the select board. Is that the correct title that the board wishes to see? Well, we've never had the discussion. Right. So that's why I'm kind of bringing it up because it does tie back into those planning commission hearings. I know a lot of other towns are using um, executive board instead of select board, but mm -hmm. yeah. which one? Which one brings the most money? <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> executive board. My <laughs> board. I lean more towards the executive board, but you know, if you guys are comfortable with the select board, then uh, I'm not going to argue. Um, pretty neutral on this uh, subject. I, I think it's. A, I think we should do it. I'm going to support the idea, but the name. You know, if somebody has a strong feeling, I'm just saying. I talking to town council. A lot of towns and cities are doing it. A tremendous amount of them. And they're either using an executive board or select board, from what I've heard. 
So what would we run for if we were an executive board? Like would you still be called selectman and select woman? No, you'd be an executive board member. Board member. Just board member, okay. You'd just be an executive board member. Executive man, executive woman. You're running for the executive board. Right. Yes. I don't know. I know that town council said that they've been doing this for many municipalities, but I'm wondering what the designation has been. From what I've seen on the listserv and when this discussion comes up, it, it's a shift from select board of select men to select board and board members, but I mean, it's as inconsequential as town manager to, you know, to what, what's the change? Amazing. <laughs> town and, town <laughs> amazing. <laughs> town <laughs> administrator, <laughs> town manager. Let's not make this any more difficult yeah. than it has to be. It's, you already have it written up for select board. Does yeah. anybody have any objection to it? No. Is there a special? Then let's move on. Yeah. You have it done. You have it written up. Unless there's an objection between now and then, sleep on it. We can, we still have time. What else? Um, going through, I don't think there's any substantive change to the town meeting dates. Again, to be clear, this would give the board the authority to set the June and October town meetings on any date in those months. The hearing also would be able to be held as late as March 31st, rather than uh, the current deadline of the regular being, it being conducted to set the town meeting dates on a regular meeting in the, in the month of January. Um, so, okay, go on. Is there a, is there a, a uh, time? Is it the same time when we review the meeting dates related to religious holidays? Do we do it all at once? Yes, uh, this would extend the timeline for that to take place from being in the month of January to occurring before March 31st. Before March 31st. That's correct. And it can accommodate past desires to consider Saturday town meetings? It could, yes. It could. That's how we have it work. Okay. We want maximum flexibility there. These seems to be a key word tonight. Words. 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 <laughs> okay. Any other questions on that one? Where are we down to? 38 now? Number 38? What'd you say, Michael? Move on to what? Uh, another article. Oh. Discussion on another. I have a question um, on 33. Yeah, oh, 33. I wasn't sure where we were. That's why I was asking. 33, yeah. Uh, 33. There's snow and ice. I just, I'd like to know where our board stands. I did meet uh, Michael and I met with the uh, police chief and Chris Operation Deming and Andrew. Mark Clark. Yes. Yep. And we went over, we talked about whether the town's going to plow the sidewalks or not. And honestly, there's like, what I'll exaggerate is about 110 moving parts on this whole subject. And the one part I think we can all agree on is we got a bylaw that's clunky. My personal preference would be for this article to just repeal that bylaw and then we'll start fresh. We got all summer to put something in there that makes sense. We all know why the bylaw doesn't work. There's problems with the town doing it in the areas of where Papa Gino's is. There's a six foot wall right next, like literally around the sidewalk. And when they would shoot it off the top, they would literally be pelting it off the windows of Papa Gino's, the snow, to get over that wall. There's a, uh, the Jewish cemetery up before Century 21 where there's stones, I don't know. We looked at an aerial, Michael, it didn't look like it was more than five or six feet off the sidewalks. Mm -hmm. Chain link fence, we'd be throwing snow against gravestones. Um, just the logistics of this, what I don't know. What are they know. doing with it now? I, right now, actually, Chief Murphy told me there's like a 75-year-old guy that shovels it. He's waiting for a heart attack. Hand shovels it. Um, because you can't. You would literally be throwing them against the gravestones. There's that close to the well, that's front. The problem with this bylaw, when I asked the chief, I said, you know, what is his thoughts? And he said, I don't think you need to do anything because it's working. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, this is the first year he can actually say the bylaw is working. Now, the business owners don't like it because it costs them a lot of anxiety and money. And um, that's why they don't like it. But the chief says it worked. It's well, it's working. working because I advise the business community, listen, we're trying to do something with you here, be on your best behavior this winter. So they are getting it done. My whole problem, the bylaw just is, it's just, it doesn't serve the purpose of a clear sidewalk from point A to point B. And that's the purpose of the bylaw. So I think we should just scrap it. No, the purpose of the bylaw is for public safety. 
Yeah, to have a clean sidewalk from, from Reading to Andover. Doesn't yeah. give us public safety because of the design of Exactly. Of I'm, the we're saying the same thing. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't serve the purpose of the statute or the bylaw. It's, it's I think the key of, to me is it's public safety first and foremost. And right now we're forcing people onto the streets. Even if this bylaw is hundred percent adhered to, we're forcing that's my people on the street to serve thing from day one. So I think we should just scrap it. So what's the board want to do? Okay, you love it. I, I mean, I think, I think it needs to stay. I understand this. It's clunky, but I don't know what this is. Are we supposed to add language in here to rewrite it? No. <laughs> it, well, it's what, saying add, delete what I'm and is add. We repeal it now, and then we have all summer to try to fix it and get it. But I don't even know why we have to repeal it. Why do we have to do anything? If our October town if you meeting fix is it. when we want to deal with it, let's just deal with it in October. Why do anything now? Is there a I, We've been meeting with the business community religiously over the last few months and what the idea of dealing with this in June. Uh, there's an expectation there. Well, I just think it keeps yeah. a lot more motive, momentum if we keep it in place until October because repealing it, now people can just slow down and there'll be no momentum because we don't have a bylaw. That's my concern. And I'd rather have a bylaw with the willingness of the board making a commitment that between now and October town meeting, somebody's going to take the action to work with, you know, the business owners to come up with a reasonable approach to this. The only approach it cost the town more money. And the only approach that's reasonable is if we have a, a full contiguous sidewalk, as we've all said, and that's the problem no. with this all. Oh, yeah, you got to figure that out. That's nothing that's going to happen overnight. That's that's the biggest problem with this bylaw from day one is we don't have the sidewalk that's contiguous. We have those gaps. And you're not going to have that for the next 40 years. And it yeah. doesn't matter. No, you're though. not going to have it for the next yeah. 40 years. So, you gotta, so the, the, but I think the question comes, you know, Obviously, it needs to be tweaked, and a determination needs to be made as to whether or not the town's going to handle it or not. That's the first one. Is the town going to handle it or not? Yeah. That's the first question that this board has to answer. And if it is, then there's no real need for it, is there? You know? And if we're not, what are, we, what are our reasonable expectations for the business owners, the property owners out there to do? What we have in place right now, is it reasonable? I don't think it's fully reasonable. No, no. I, I don't think it's fully reasonable. So, okay, so what's the solution? That's what the solution needs to be. So, first question is, is the town going to handle it and not find anybody or not? And again, those areas where it's impractical to do things, chances are, public safety-wise, as there are in many sections of the road, it's going to be an issue. But the public safety issue is not going to be resolved in the next 40 years because you're not going to get sidewalks up and down 28 you know so from the state you know so could this board live with not having a bylaw and not and not having shoveled sidewalks on route 28 what? can we live with that what i didn't well again there was a determination made that, that wasn't a good idea you know and we still think it's a good idea from a public state safety standpoint to do as much as we can and have as much done as can as you know that's practical um Again, so. back to the original question. Is the town going to See, I don't take like on the responsibility for these taxpaying individuals to do it to the town's satisfaction? I just and it's not going to satisfy everybody. We're never going to be able to satisfy everybody. No, but and I right now, we're not satisfying very many people at all. You know? Those of that are on the capital <laughs> improvement committee will, will know that you know, these machines are very expensive, and then when you're going up and down Route 28 with that material that's going to be hitting, it's going to break those machines even worse. That's so okay, but you also have to understand that these property owners out there pay taxes and, again, uh, contribute to the community in other ways and have certain costs associated with them being members of our community that are different than a residential homeowner. They don't have kids. Every charitable, uh, I know, but they don't have kids. No one They're, disagrees. I know. I, so it's, I, you know, it's. So that's the decision we have to make first, I believe, is are we going to have the town assume the responsibility, including purchase of capital equipment, in order to maintain as best on, we can. It is on CIPC for another sidewalk machine. Yeah, but that's not going to rise to the level of, that won't get funded. Um, I don't know about that. It was pretty high up in the list. Was when push comes to shove, I guess yeah, it's. it was. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in the draft plan right now to be yeah. funded for fiscal year 19. Yeah. Only because we're actually short a piece of equipment. That's, that's <laughs> for municipal. Yeah. That's okay. for, for 
that's that's not necessarily for private business snow removal. That's for municipal. Right. Snow All I'm saying removal. is we have to have another one if we're going to do this. So if the expectation is it's going to. I mean, yes. Through you, Mr. Chairman, one of the great things that came up in the conversation is I mean, we can. We can do anything we want, but it, it's a matter of wh what is the priority going to be and what's the order that gets done in. And, um, right. you know, right now we, our focus so. has been the walking routes to the schools. You know, we can, prior we can reprioritize Main Street. Uh, but right now, the way the bylaw exists, there's the, we, we can be assured that people are under an obligation to get the snow removed within some sort of a timeline. Uh, yes. I, I just theoretically speaking, a business owner wants to clear off their sidewalks to invite guests in to their establishment. So I don't see why no, we there, would there's be. There's nobody walking to their establishments. That's the problem. There's people coming in and out of their establishments. They're of course they are. Mr. Schultz, I, 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 I mean, I'd love I, to hear what I, Mrs. Mignopelli was saying. I think that this is not even a debatable topic in terms of why it would be in their best interest to clear their, their walkways and sidewalks so people can come and, come and go to their business. It doesn't even make sense to even discuss that or debate a repeal of it. I can understand the issue that we're facing with the enforcement mechanism of the ordinance, but repealing it means no one's responsible for at least clearing those sidewalks that can be cleared on that. And people do walk that road. If I may yes. reply. The, the problem is it's a couple... <laughs> It, the problem that you have is, is it's multifaceted, it, and it's there's no perfect solution to this. I think we can all agree on that. The, one of the things we just mentioned, I think Mr. Chair just mentioned that we don't want the town to do this because we could break the machines. Well, this is the same kind of thing we want to have the business owners do because they don't have the machinery for this, and it's a real, it's difficult. I don't think people are walking to their businesses. They're doing their driveways. They're driving to the businesses. We don't have a walkable downtown area. And right now, even if this thing is fully compliant, we're still forcing people out with 28 on areas that have no sidewalk. Do we want to be doing that? Or do we want to just basically say, we don't have a sidewalk, don't walk on that when there's snow on there? I don't know. That doesn't What's make any sense, though, honest, well, honestly. I, to say that a business owner who has guests and invitees coming isn't going to clear off the sidewalk that they have, it makes no sense. But that, they, that, they don't have people that, using the sidewalk because they're They're only clearing one to make it upon the town to clear the entire thing for all businesses who do have sidewalks in, instead of just that business owner clearing their own sidewalk doesn't make any no, I doesn't make concern. any logical sense to me for to put that upon the town when that owner only has to clear their portion of the sidewalk where their guests and invitees are patrons are coming in. But their guests and invitees, number one, aren't using the sidewalk. And number two, they're having to clear two lanes of Route twenty eight that's dumped on them. They're not clearing the natural accumulation. I would have, if you could go through with a stove blower, fine. The problem is they're getting two lanes of salt and, and ice and plowed off by a state road onto their sidewalk. They're getting all these the plows. It's not like they're just shoveling the, the eight inches that fell. They're shoveling the 20 inches of ice that's thrown on there. And I think they are taxpayers. They don't use the schools. They don't use the services like residents do. I, I think as a, bit, as a town, we should do something. Yeah, more. but they're not taxed like residents. That's, you know, I hear this from you guys. I do. And I believe me, I'm a business person myself. But they're not taxed the same way. If we were all taxed the same way, I'd agree with you like this. I would absolutely be 100% on board. But this income and expense approach and to their taxes, and we can debate this all day long, I think that maybe there's some wiggle room in the middle on this one. But I don't think they should get off scot-free because they don't pay the taxes the same level we do. If you look at the way their taxes have risen compared to a residential property, it's been significantly different. So, you know, this is a very expensive approach or proposal that's being made not only just for the labor of it, but the maintenance and the replacement, the quick replacement of this equipment. Well, my proposal is repeal the, repeal it. And I just think you don't have a, well, I'm, once you I'm repeal not going to repeat it, myself. Yeah. There's going to be no motivation to, to create a new one. So I'm not sure I'm in agreement with repealing, but I'm certainly prepared to participate if you need it between now and October to get something together. Um, I, I think we, we told the business community they wanted to put a citizen's petition on there. We told them, we basically told them to take it off because we're going to do something. Now yes. if we don't do it. I think we are going to do something in October. Yeah, I, I, well, I'm just one of five. I don't agree with it. Okay. Well, we got to move on and we got to make a decision. So, so what, what am I to report? To the, what's my charge to report back 
to the business community. We, we seem to be all over the place on this, though. So. That's that's probably the accurate report. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's your business. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, though. I don't agree with it being repealed. I agree that maybe it needs to be, the language needs to be taken a look at in terms of the enforcement issue. But I, I don't think removing the obligation you know, to clear off should be repealed. I still don't think we understand the full financial impact of us doing it and the risks and the problems we're causing with it. I still would like to explore that between now in October, but I also think there, there's another potential solution, which is to tweak this bylaw so it's reasonable. So guys like the Horseshoe don't have to shovel a walkway to nowhere. It makes no sense to force them to yeah. plow up a walkway that goes nowhere. So we should be able to build some flexibility into the bylaw, even if we have to get it down to specific locations that get relief. That's probably what you'd have to do, yeah. And you should build that lot by lot and then we could decide who pays for those areas that now have to get done and maybe that's a lot more reasonable to have the town do the areas that are just reasonable and we also thought about uh, uh, mr gilberto we, we spoke about i don't know what the terminology is but not a, not a tax but a, a service fee we kicked that idea around too mm -hmm. yeah. i like that to the businesses once a year to as a i don't know it's i don't know capital. how you would word it but at least do something towards a capital fund yeah. or we do a shift which I know they're not gonna like but we could do a shift which could no it can't be a tax it has to be a service fee um, like the trash fee that we, we spoke that's, about there was some legalities that's great I love, I love it I and mean, I think Andrew at least just what we discussed there there's a lot to work on between now and October and I think if we go back and you go back to them say them the goal is to uh, not re not do anything there's no need to rep repeal it now just get it done between now it's and October. It's not going to snow after today. Anyway. And guess what? If they don't like it, if they don't like the momentum that we have between now and October, they could certainly they do their citizen petition. petition on that. Yeah. yeah. There's no mean no snow. It snows over. I just want to add. Yes. Can you just, get that in a just one more. Once you start to charge the fee to provide the service, you marry the liability for it. Yeah. I think. But you're asking them to marry the liability now. They you're, already do. They're, they're they properties be, insured. They shouldn't be for liable that for that type of risk. They have to take two lanes of snow at the state's dumping on their sidewalk, clean it off, and they're liable for their cleaning off of yeah. the state's snow. And I don't think it's that's right. That's why I think that's, there's, yeah. there's, 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 there's some room in the middle on this one. And I think if we can give an opportunity to get a map out, really explore it, there's certain areas that should get done and there's certain areas that shouldn't get done. And when we get done figuring out the areas that should be done, maybe it's a lot more reasonable for the town to do it. And then the cost won't be so great and I certainly won't have as much concern. And especially if we can layer on top of it some kind of a buy-in by the business community on Route 28 to pay a fee, I think we get a home run. I think we can get there. I, I think- With the past home I think. Yeah. yeah, and I think everybody, I don't think anybody here is in disagreement, I haven't heard, about not shoveling certain sidewalks when they, mean they, when they don't cause any benefit, right? So why spend the money? Why go through the trouble? I think we might have an equal protection argument with that, though. You can't just single out similarly situated no, You damn lawyers. Excuse me. Yeah. Don't put that in the record. Um, work it out. But I don't want to repeal it unless any... If you've got three members that want to do a repeal, then let's let's make a decision now. But if not, can we just give Mr. Schultz the uh, the edict to get back to the folks in the business? We've done everything you've said to do, though. So there's really nothing else to do at this point. We've gone through. We. Well, when are you guys meeting next? No reason to meet with them again. Yeah, you've got a lot of work between now and October. We've already isolated parcels. We sat down the other day for an hour and a half in Michael's office isolating parcels. We've I, you can't just say you're going to pay it and you're not. You can't. I, don't, I think there's an equal protection argument there. I mean, I, I just, we either got to, like what Steve said, we're either going to do it or we're not going to do it. I don't think there's, it's like being kind of pregnant. But I mean, you just said we can't do it because there's certain areas that we're going to cause damage to Papa Gino. It's going to cause damage no, to No, we have to have a police detail there, so we have to shoot the snow into a truck. That's the, we can't shoot it off the road. Well, we can shoot it onto the road that way. That's fine, because we've done all the stuff you're being Where's asked it going to do. Now? Where's Papa Gino snow going now? They, they they hand shovel. They hand shovel uh, one, one lane. Yeah, one, one pedestrian one lane. Yeah. Like this way. They make eight yeah. glues out of it. Yeah. 
<laughs> there's also a pole or a sign right in there, oh, sure. which they could not get they by. They couldn't get by anyways. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Right. From my perspective, we lost well, Maureen, so that means we need to get going. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and until you right. fix the road and put in sidewalks that go the length, look like the town of for the sake Andover, of uh, ready. Save there it. is no solution. Well, yeah, you know, except to ask people to clear their their walkways best they can. And they can do outreach to the community and try to get something passed at the town meeting. That there's their prerogative too. Absolutely, I mean, they can certainly do that. But I, mean, I certainly think that we're better off. You guys writing up something, coming here and presenting to us. Well, again, they can do it under this article. If the article's I mean, left in the warrant, times, they have an opportunity to offer a proposal, up to and including repealing. See, if you met with them once, I haven't met with them probably four or five yeah. times. There's nothing more I can talk to them about this. But this article doesn't have the language, so it's yeah. waiting on the language yeah. to be added, right? The board asked for the placeholder, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah just the placeholder. And, and just don't think you'd lose anything by waiting until October. I'll instruct them if they should do a citizen yeah. petition for this fall. How about this? We're meeting on October 23rd, so. April 23rd. What's that? Oh, April? April 23rd, right? October. October. Yeah. yeah. So I said October? Yeah. Sure. So they can come here and speak. Be heard. No, I don't want to. I'm not going to. No. We're not having a, you know, it's not a hearing yet. Come during public they comment. come during the, the yeah. hearing. Public comments. But, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, why don't you talk to them about holding off until October, but work on a solid plan between now and October. So put it together, we'll right? Ask them if it, they're offering they anything. Are, saying, are they offering anything other than repeal? Yeah, that, that's the problem. It's, it's are they either. offering anything other than repeal? Right. I'll ask them. Right. Yeah. That's it. Simple as that. Doesn't seem to be an appetite to repeal. Offering something other than repeal. Yeah. I might be in favor of repeal just to get rid of this as a topic of discussion repetitively, but <laughs> but now I think it's a safety issue. Okay. What else? What other article? That was productive. <laughs> you know, this has still, been a nemesis for one. 20 yeah. years. This is all the yes. repeal. Right? Yeah. No. no other new article. No solution. What about 38? You go for a repeal? No. no. All right. so <laughs> 38 has been on the warrant in previous drafts. I mean, I, I can't sit here and but tell you that. I we thought we weren't going to. Are we supporting this article or not supporting this article? Okay. I, I, I think the challenges are numerous for this article. Um, and for those who don't know, we're talking about the uh, paving of Swamp Pond Road. Um, there was a, the article was uh, received and referred to the town engineers uh, to do some initial uh, work on. The town engineer has since retired. Uh, I, I think that the earliest we could even responsibly consider this would probably be at the October town meeting just based on the transition in, in the department that's not going right now never mind the myriad of legal issues that are out there with regard to this area but it was submitted as a citizen's petition it does get placed should be placed on the warrant as such and um, but right now we don't we're not there in terms of a, a, pro a construction project taking place the town hasn't acquired the interest in the properties to to construct on it there isn't even a layout We've done some of these kind of um, private-public partnerships on some of these um, unpaved roads. Mm. They're almost always at least laid out on a plan of some sort that doesn't even exist with Swamp Pond Road for this section. So it's just very challenging. Um, yeah, never mind the zoning. What's, never mind the zoning nonconformance that we'll create by bisecting a series of lots that may already not be in conformance <laughs> with the zoning bylaw. So there's some challenges with that. Okay. What is do we actually have any, in terms of the eminent domain requirements for the taking of people's parcels and and just the layout of a road there, do we have some sense of what estimate of what this would actually cost to the town and where we would get that kind of money to do this? I mean, we'd have to have some sort of a some sort of information to present because this is obviously going to be presented at the town meeting. So the, again, under the town's existing betterment bylaw, which we sought to modify in October, but determined that we were not there yet in terms of what the modifications would be, um, this was referred to the town engineer's office to do some initial work on it. I'll check with the acting DPW director to see where it was left prior to the town engineer's last day on Friday. Uh, but 
I, I just I don't see that we'll be prepared to responsibly initiate this type of public works construction project this this spring. And it's not because I don't think it should be done or because it's not important work. It's just the, it's a it's a significant project. These, Never mind the funding source. The, the, no, the, these residents have been probably the most patient and uh, consistently dogged, you know, in, in relation to trying to get something done and work with the town over the years, you know, and they just keep getting stonewalled and put off and um, some promises made, not kept, um, you know, maintenance of the road is obviously an issue for, for the town from a public safety yeah. standpoint. I mean, they go up there, they grade it, puts more material down and grade it again and then it washes out and you know, it's like other sections of town around too. You know, like up in my area where I live, there's a couple of roads. You know, you've got Maple and you've got Hancock, and you know, six just wash out. And it's the resources and the time that we spend there. It's a quick fix. But what we spent over the years, a lot of the residents would be willing. Then the problem is, you know, can we bring it, bring it up to a standard which is safe and adequate access? And what does that mean? Does it mean that it has to be, you know, so much packed down here and so wide over here because it's never going to come into conformance total conformance by the same token you know we're spending a lot of resources uh, annually on these roads and the residents are still you know not getting what uh, the response that they feel that they they're deserving of but th this particular people it's, it's been 25 30 years the same people you know no, I, I, I wish we could just do something non-conforming. Can we legally put a warrant article to agree on something that's non-conforming? Well, I think our betterment bylaw is, is allows for some non-conforming yeah. betterments that's we shared should, by the town and, and the residents. And again, we have an awful lot of the town of Rothready owns a lot of land up in that this area, we too. We plow this area now, right? We do. Right. So I don't see what the harm is by trying to have a a bylaw or something that gives us some flexibility to at least lay down some asphalt to have a safe public way that doesn't that's non-conforming it's better than it we should have some justification better than what it is, you know, um, you know the, the, the problem is is that when you do that does it provide safe and adequate access to some lots that currently the planning commission has required individuals to upgrade as they're looking to build out so it's Cuts both ways. Uh, it, it's not an easy subject, but it's it's one that, that should be addressed. And good for them for you know, Mrs. Gravata for bringing it forward again. Okay. You know. Yes, Mr. We Jones. have a rough idea of cost estimate. Oh, it, it depends on when you talk to them. I mean, we had one that was you know thirty some odd thousand dollars, and now we have one that's three hundred and seventeen thousand dollars. You know, so it's it's all over the spectrum based upon you know what is really required of us to bring it up to whatever standard it's going to be. Okay, so what's the risk if we don't take some charge of it? We just let it happen at town meeting. Well, no, it's going to pay more tasks. I think we should have some sort of an idea of how many parcels need we would need to consider eminent domain taking, and they're giving us twenty seven hundred feet, so we have could map out the engineer or whoever could potentially map out because of other roadway projects. What the cost of that is, they're talking about similarly paved to other areas of gravel pavement. So 2,700 feet similarly, I guess. Well, we did a section, you know, not too long ago. Of How much did road. that cost? And we, we have contractors already doing roadway work, so would it be? <laughs> so the problem is we don't have a DPW director, we don't have a town engineer. I know. That's correct. That's I know real that. Problem. What do you mean? Mark Clark's business card is about this big right now with all the titles. <laughs> yeah, it really is. But we should have some understanding <laughs> Water of Water payments. We have to answer what the cost of this would be. Yeah. You know? Yeah. All right. I mean, making a recommendation on what right. the cost. Right, right. There, there has been some work done by the town engineer. I think I'll ask the acting director to touch base with the now retired engineer and confirm where that was left off. So let's regroup on this on the 23rd. Okay. Um, town Administrator Report. So quickly. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, two things to report. First, the Yard Waste Drop-Off Center has been open for the 2018 season since mid-March. 
due to the lingering snowpack, the Department of Public Works has extended the acceptance of brush at the drop-off center through the month of April. The hours are 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Saturdays only. Contractors are prohibited and proof of residency is required. Uh, secondly, we're in the process of advertising vacancies for laborer and related positions in the Department of Public Works. We intend, and I've included a chart, uh, to fill uh, positions, four positions identified on the attached chart. I'm um, really bringing this up because one of those positions, uh, identified as number two, was uh, funded in the fiscal year 2018 budget in the salary pool, but in the fiscal year 2019 recommendation was actually funded within the departmental budget. This is a, a special highway equipment, special heavy equipment operator position. And if you look on the table of organization, it's actually dedicated to the cemetery, although it does work in highway as well. So we hope that this will address some of the uh, concerns relative to the maintenance of the, the cemetery. Uh, and it will also give us an extra set of hands, uh, which we badly need. I would also note that we're not filling the water treatment plant operator positions that are currently vacant in the water department. That's being done with purpose. We're managing the workload using the existing staffing um, to cover water treatment operations with the understanding that eventually we will not be operating the water treatment plants. And that concludes my comments for this evening. I'm going to go first. In accordance with the open meeting law, the board <laughs> states for the record, this meeting is being recorded by NORCAM. It may be recorded by other local media. <laughs> That's why we should do new business earlier. <laughs> Mr. O'Leary. Uh, uh, just again, it, to your point earlier, you know, it's probably more appropriate to, to mention these things earlier in the meeting, but you know, the passing of Kenny Jones, I don't know if it, you knew Kenny uh, yeah. very well. Uh, Ken was a longtime public servant, uh, so had served on the finance committee for a number of years, a number of building committees, lifelong resident of the community. Um, used to be an animal lover until he brew his roses, prize-winning roses, and the deer started eating it. Then he was talking about getting a gun. But a uh, terrific fellow uh, again, who gave countless hours of, uh, of his time and uh, totally devoted to the community and uh, unfortunately passed away uh, a couple of weeks ago. And just a terrific fellow from a great family who uh, again, used to be local business people here in town. Uh, he owned Candlewood Lanes for a number of years. His father owned Jones Brothers hardware store, which was down where the Hornets is currently located. Uh, but just great family, but a great guy. And uh, again, uh, condolences to his uh, daughter, Leslie, and uh, son, Paul. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I didn't, I didn't hear that. I didn't see any notes. Oh, Kenny? Yeah. It was in last week's paper. Was it? Yeah, yeah. Mr. Masseri. I don't have anything at the moment. I Mr. mean, Schultz. we talked enough about the end over water. Yeah. Uh, looking forward to getting past Wednesday, uh, next meeting, making decisions yeah. one way or the other. I'm looking forward to that too. And, uh, Mr. Moving Schultz. on. A couple of quick public service announcements. There's a bicycle collection drive for charity. It's Saturday, April 14th from 9 to 1 p.m. at St. Agnes Church in Reading. That's for the um, Bikes Not Bombs group that uh, reclaims thousands of bicycles each year as a vehicle for social change to provide environmentally friendly and sustainable transportation to school and work for people around the globe. And also locally, we have Get Fit North Reading starting April 21st, if you want to come out. And uh, all skill levels, please come on out. You can sign up through Parks and Rec. Mrs. Minupelli. Just something we probably should have said at the beginning too is congratulations to Captain Nash for Oh, yeah. Umpteen years of service to the town. Thank you for your service. Uh, good luck with your next next season or next phase and whatever your endeavors are in retirement. And we appreciate all you you've done for the town and the fire department. Can I just echo that a little bit too? Yes. Yeah, Ricky, we sat across the table with him number number of times. You know, negotiations and uh, uh, again. Good advocate for his uh, his fellow workers over there at the fire department. Always has been, uh, but always a gentleman about it. And it's been a pleasure working with him all these years. Great guy. I wish him long, healthy, and happy retirement. Thank you. No, I I've, I've enjoyed my conversations with uh, Captain Nash. It was a pleasure working with him. Uh, yes, we didn't always see eye to eye, but he was always very respectful and always listened, uh, willing to listen and consider. But uh, said he's a very good advocate for the men there and always willing to listen but 
Not very easy to agree. No, <laughs> but he will listen. He, he, he was a man guy. of his word. And I really do wish him and his family well in his retirement. Um, I only have one thing, and uh, Mike, I'm just curious, uh, am I in the running for the name of the baby, or my name in there? Or is it going to be Steve, Bob, Andy, <laughs> Kate? Catherine? Um, this could be the last meeting. With, Catherine uh, Andrews, uh, right. We may not see you for a little bit, but I want to wish your wife well. And hope she's, I know she's up listening, and yes. um, I know she's due next week. Yes, next yeah. week. Uh, so Thank I you. wish her well, you and your, your family well, and Thank take you. the time you need. Is uh, cherish the moments because it does go pretty quick, as you know. Other than that, I, I have nothing. I'll take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. I got a motion and a second by Mr. Mayor. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.